This happened to me on October 12, 2008. Hunting season in full swing up in the rugged mountains of Colorado. I used to love it. Good excuse to get some quiet time in my little cabin on some family land. That year, it felt different. My name's Wyatt. Morning of opening day, I'd been out for a couple hours. Hadn't seen a single deer, and worse, barely even heard any birds, no squirrels making a ruckus. It felt off, like the whole wood was holding its breath. I shrugged it off at first, part of the hunter's paranoia, I guess. Around noon, I decided to head further up the slopes, see if my luck changed. Found myself following what looked like deer tracks, but they seemed off. Too big. Too widely spaced. Then I spotted something on the ground, blood. A lot of blood. That's when the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. A bad feeling hit me like a ton of bricks. Some predator got to a deer, I figured maybe a cougar. Had my rifle ready, just in case. Followed the tracks and blood, pushing through thick bushes until I came into a small clearing. And that's when I saw the body, or what was left of it. It was a deer, but savaged. Torn almost in half. Huge gashes in its flesh, like something with massive claws had raked it open. No cougar could do that. A bear, maybe, but it felt wrong, all wrong. Whatever killed this deer, it wanted to kill it. Suddenly, a noise made me freeze. A branch cracking behind me. I spun around, rifle raised, and it stepped out of the trees. My first coherent thought was that I must have lost my mind because nobody would believe this. This thing, it was huge, at least eight feet tall standing on its hind legs. It was fur-covered but the fur was patchy and matted, revealing some kind of dark leathery skin underneath. Its face was, I can't even describe it, long, snout-like, with rows of sharp, jagged teeth dripping with saliva. But the eyes, they were worst of all, blood red and burning with a hunger that sent chills down my spine. It let out a low, menacing growl, the rumbling vibration of it rattling through me to my core. Then it stood up, forelimbs tipped with claws the size of my hunting knife. I fired my rifle. The deafening blast echoed through the trees, but I don't think I hit it. It screeched, a high-pitched, ear-splitting sound, then lunged forward. I threw myself backwards, scrambling for purchase in the loose dirt of the clearing. The creature landed where I'd been standing, claws ripping into the ground. I fired again, this one more of a lucky shot as I fumbled with the bolt action. It stumbled, roared. Then it turned and disappeared. The whole encounter lasted maybe ten seconds, but it felt like a lifetime. I lay there, gasping for air, my whole body trembling. When I could finally stand... I realized I was clutching a chunk of its fur in my fist. It was coarse, wiry, with the same rotten smell you find around dead animals on the road. This thing wasn't natural, not an animal I recognized. I stumbled back down the trail to my cabin. As I walked, my mind raced. What the hell was that? Part of me still expected to wake up, realize it was a horrible nightmare found my landline, hands still shaking as I dialed the sheriff's office. They sounded skeptical, figured I was a drunk hunter seeing things. Told them to head to my coordinates. They'd find the deer carcass and prove I wasn't lying. By the time the deputy arrived, the sun was dipping below the mountains. He surveyed the scene with a grim expression. The remains of the deer were even more gruesome in the twilight the blood almost black against the snow-dusted ground. Can't say I've ever seen anything do this to an animal. He muttered, more to himself than me. I handed him the tuft of fur. He examined it, turning it in the fading light. 
Just then, a howl shattered the silence. A long, mournful cry that chilled me to the bone. It echoed off the mountains, seeming to come from everywhere at once. The deputy and I exchanged a look. That wasn't a coyote. That wasn't anything normal. Let's get back to your cabin, he said, voice tense. I'm calling in for backup. That night, huddled indoors with all the lights blazing, we waited. The woods were alive with rustles, strange snaps and creaks, and that bone-chilling howl coming again and again. The backup never arrived. Turns out, the nearest unit got called away to some kind of domestic disturbance hours away. We were alone. The deputy was a local, new folks who had disappearances over the years. Hikers, the occasional rancher foolish enough to venture out too far. Whispers in the local bars about strange creatures sighted, rumors never reported officially. We're not dealing with something normal out there, he said, gripping his shotgun a little tighter. As dawn approached, the noises faded, leaving us with a heavy silence. I packed what I could, grabbed my grandpa's old pistol and loaded it with shaking hands. I wasn't planning on running, but if that thing came back, well, I wasn't going down without a fight. The deputy radioed for assistance again, gave my coordinates, and grimly informed them he wasn't sure how long we'd hold out. He wanted to try and reach a neighboring property but didn't want to leave me alone. We spent what felt like an eternity waiting in that cabin. Every creak of the old wooden structure, every rustling of leaves outside, set my teeth on edge. The deputy paced, checking the windows every few minutes. Late that morning, I heard the unmistakable sound of a helicopter. Relief surged through me. I'd never been so happy to hear that chopping, rhythmic beat. But as the sound grew louder, my relief turned to dread. Something was wrong with the noise. It was too rough, accompanied by a high-pitched whine and muffled thumps. The deputy and I rushed outside in time to see the helicopter spiraling wildly. It was clipping the treetops, blades wobbling dangerously. I saw dark shapes clinging to its sides, silhouettes against the sky. Then it happened. One of the creatures, the same type I had fought in the clearing, ripped huge chunks from the helicopter's body, metal peeling like tin foil. The helicopter lurched, the pilot desperately struggling to control it. It smashed into the trees, exploding in a fireball that shook the ground. Smoke and flames billowed up, and the screams echoed in the silence that followed. We were on our own. The rest of the day was a blur of panic and grim determination. We fortified the cabin as best we could, barricading windows and doors. I checked the ammo, grimly realizing it wouldn't last long if multiple creatures attacked. The deputy was a good man, name was Rhodes. He kept a level head, even as the knowledge settled in that we were probably going to die up here. As night fell, those terrible howls started up again, closer this time. Our defenses wouldn't hold. We both knew it. Rhodes made a decision. We can't stay here. We'll be sitting ducks, he said, his voice thick. He had a plan, a crazy one, but it might be our only chance. We snuck out the back, moving silently into the woods. The howls were coming from the south. We headed north, praying the creatures were distracted. Miles turned into an eternity of stumbling through the darkness, clinging to the hope that Rhodes knew a way out we didn't. Just when I thought my legs would give out, we broke through the tree line, and I saw it, a dirt road winding along the base of the mountain. It seemed impossible in that moment, like a mirage. But Rhodes squeezed my shoulder. Old logging access, barely used anymore. Then we picked up the pace, running for our lives. Behind us, the howls were getting closer. 
I heard the crashing of trees, their heavy footfalls pounding the ground, shaking it with each step. We reached the road just as the first creature burst into view. I raised my pistol, firing more in desperation than any true aim. The shots didn't seem to do anything, but perhaps it stalled them for a crucial second. More emerged from the trees, three of them, massive, loping figures in the moonlight. Rhodes grabbed my arm and pulled me along. The road! Find a vehicle, anything! He shouted, his voice hoarse. We sprinted down the road, the creatures in full pursuit now, their guttural growls raising goose bumps all over my body. My lungs burned. My legs screamed. Then I saw it, an old, rusted-out pickup truck, half-buried in a ditch. Rhodes reached the truck first, heaving himself into the driver's seat. No keys in the ignition. He swore, then started ripping wires from under the dash, fingers flying. I risked a look behind us. The creatures were gaining fast, their eyes burning red in the darkness. If we didn't get out of there. The engine sputtered and coughed, then roared to life. I scrambled into the passenger side as Rhodes threw the truck into gear. Dirt flew as we peeled out of the ditch bumping wildly down the road. Through the rear window, I saw the creatures leaping onto the road, reaching for us with their monstrous claws. A few shots from Rhodes' shotgun made them duck for cover, buying us just enough time. We swerved and bounced along, praying the old truck held together. Then, as if a switch was flipped, the pursuit ended. The creatures stopped by the tree line, screeching and howling at us as we disappeared into the night. Had they given up? Was there some territorial limitation? I didn't care. All I knew was that, for the moment, we were safe. We made it to the nearest town hours later, exhausted, covered in mud, and smelling like fear. Our story to the local police sounded insane, but there wasn't much they could do. No bodies of the creatures, the helicopter wreckage too remote to reach quickly. The deer carcass and my torn-up cabin proved something was out there, but not exactly what. Rhodes filled out a lengthy report, but both of us knew it'd get filed away under the crackpot category. They gave us blankets, coffee, the sympathetic but suspicious looks that said they thought we were delusional drunks or fugitives maybe covering up the murder of the helicopter's crew. Didn't matter. We weren't going back up there. I never saw Rhodes again after that. Figured he put in for a transfer far away from those mountains, from the memories of the things he saw that night. Me, I sold the land. Cheap. Didn't even tell the buyers why. Let them think I was a fool, whatever. I just needed to get as far away as possible. Years have passed. I have a wife and kids now, life in a bustling suburb about as far removed from the wilderness as you can get. They've never heard the story, of course. My wife just thinks I don't like camping. And most of the time, I managed to convince myself it was a nightmare, a fever dream brought on by mountain solitude. But some nights... I hear a rustle in the bushes, catch a fowl, rotting whiff on the breeze. Or I'll see the glint of red eyes in the headlights of a passing car. And then I know. They're still out there. In the dark corners of the forests, in the stories whispered around campfires, in the nightmares of those unfortunate enough to cross their path. It was the sort of mechanical hum that makes you think your ears are playing tricks on you a constant, low-frequency vibration that seemed to be coming from the very earth beneath my feet. Working for the U.S. government on secret genetic experiments at a secluded facility deep in the forests of Northern California had its fair share of odd moments, but this was different. 
My name's Remo Barone, a lab tech by trade and an inadvertent sleuth by circumstance. That morning, we were introduced to Lev Grossman, our new head of security, an enigmatic figure with piercing blue eyes that scanned everything with meticulous skepticism. Lev's presence was commanding and his lack of words, matched only by his ability to convey everything with just a look. Most of us found it unnerving, especially Jared Manko, our lead researcher who never missed a chance to break the ice with a joke. If looks could kill, we need a new security head every week. Developments at the lab were always on a need-to-know basis, which meant we rarely knew anything until it was directly in front of us under a microscope. But that sound, it didn't take long before Lev and I were searching the facility's perimeter, guns securely holstered at our hips. No amount of training could prepare us for what lay beyond the tree line. A trail of devastation cut through the woods trees uprooted, earth gouged as if by massive claws. Lev signaled for silence as we moved closer to investigate one particularly large crevice. Throwing in a glow stick revealed something horrifying remnants of what appeared to be tissue samples intermingled with metallic fragments. What kind of experiment could do this? Lev whispered, more to himself than to me. We heard rustling, sudden and close. Weapon in hand, Lev motioned me backward when out from shadow emerged Dr. Sheila Kavinsky, her lab coat marred with grime and blood streaks. She was visibly shaken but managed to spit out her encounter before collapsing. It's skin, like an old folktale, not human. The facility blared into lockdown mode immediately after we stumbled back inside with Sheila. As per protocol during breaches, no outside help could be called containment, and secrecy were paramount above all else. As night fell over the forest canopy like a shroud, Jared joked uneasily while bandaging Sheila's wounds. Guess even Mother Nature doesn't want us messing around in her backyard. The attempt at humor did little to cut through the growing tension. Scouring over video surveillance yielded no images beyond an amorphous blur that seemed both part of the forest and yet foreign to it, a creature from local folklore perhaps, a being that should not exist per natural law yet left behind tangible carnage. Weapon drawn once more, I roamed the now dimly lit corridors towards where the creature had last been seen on camera. Every shadow seemed animated by some unseen force. Every slight creak from metal heating or cooling now signified potential movement. Just then control room alarms blared reporting multiple breaches along various sections of the compound's infrastructure. The unknown assailant wasn't acting randomly. Its movements were strategic, intelligent. Jared radioed through panicking breaths while barricading himself within Research Lab 3. Remo! It's going through walls as if they're paper. Like it knows exactly where. The radio cut off abruptly mid-sentence followed by deafening silence, as if all life itself had been sucked out from around me. I froze. The silence after Jared's last words hung thick in the air. I resisted the urge to call out for him. It would reveal my position. Instead, I backed slowly toward the nearest exit, keeping my eyes peeled for any sign of movement. A sudden commotion outside drew my attention. Screams from my colleagues mixed with a sound that resembled ripping metal. I edged towards a window and risked a glance. A large figure moved with unnatural swiftness, tearing apart barriers as though they were made of cloth. It stood at least eight feet tall. Its skin appeared to be a mix of rough textures similar to bark and stone. Muscle rippled beneath the surface as it moved, each limb ending in what could only be described as claws, sharp and efficient. Radio static brought me back to focus. I pressed the talk button. Evacuate immediately! No code for this scenario existed. Improvisation was all that was left. In a blend of planning and instinct, 
I sprinted to Lab 4. There might be a flare gun there. Upon entry, I noticed Marie lying motionless by her desk, her body mangled in a way that no fall or accident could cause, confirming she wouldn't need the flare gun anymore. Without hesitation, I grabbed the gun and dashed out of the lab toward the southern emergency exit, away from where that creature was last seen. Outside, under the scant moonlight, I let off several bright red flares into the sky. It was all I could do as a signal for help outside of our compromised communications system. Then I ran into the woods in the hopes of finding shelter until rescue arrived. After hours spent hidden within an abandoned ranger station, dawn approached and with it came the sound of helicopters and shouted commands through megaphones. An extraction team found me just as daylight began to repel the night's shadows. They asked about survivors or what had happened but I could only shake my head. In debriefing, they mentioned finding just one body Marie's confirming no others remained at the compound. Now safe at a temporary facility, people in suits asked questions about security footage and creature behavior but all remained speculation without solid evidence or understanding. Church bells from nearby towns rang for those lost unsung heroes while we survivors nursed our grief silently offering respect to their memories without words. The story ended not with comprehension but with acknowledgement. Something unknown had crossed paths with us leaving behind chaos and prompting endless questions about what lurks unseen alongside us on this planet we thought we knew so well. This happened to me on June 6, 1999. My name's Jeff Coleman, and I'd been a deputy in the small town of Willow Grove, Mississippi for, well, longer than I care to remember. Things are usually slow around here. Folks are friendly, always happy to wave or share some sweet tea. I've got a wife, Sarah, and two boys, the kind of life a man could only ever wish for. I never thought I'd see anything here that couldn't be explained away by a few restless teenagers or a moonshine bender gone wrong. Turns out, ignorance is bliss. It was just a regular Tuesday night patrol. I was passing by the old Jackson farm on my route. That place has always had a reputation for being haunted. Folks claim they've seen lights flickering in the windows or heard whispers echoing through the empty rooms. Of course, I always laugh that off, just old ghost stories spun for the grandkids. Something felt off that night. It was the quiet, not the normal kind. This was heavier, like the air itself was holding its breath. That's when I saw it, a dark shape slipping across the overgrown fields. My first thought was maybe some teenagers up to no good, but this thing moved, wrong. I flipped on my spotlight, and the beam swept across the field, catching the creature square on. It was like nothing I'd ever seen. It stood tall, easy on seven feet, and covered in thick, dark fur. Its face was vaguely dog-like, but twisted into a horrifying grimace, full of teeth as long as kitchen knives. But the eyes... Those eyes glowed with a yellow malevolent light that chilled me to the bone. For a few terrifying seconds, it stared right back at me, the eyes burning into my soul. I slammed on the gas and radioed for backup, but who the hell was I gonna call? What could I even say? Panic threatened to overtake me. I had to do something. My cruiser tore through the field, gaining on the creature in the headlights. I grabbed my rifle and let loose a barrage of shots, but it didn't even flinch. The Jackson farmhouse loomed ahead. As a last resort, I pulled up just as the creature reached the porch. I leapt from my car, slamming the door behind me. The porch was deserted, bathed in the harsh glow of the headlights. 
Come on out, you son of a... I never finished my taunt. The porch boards exploded under my feet, and a clawed hand as big as a dinner plate tore through the wood. I scrambled backward, losing my footing. The creature erupted from the hole, its roar splitting the night. Scrambling for purchase, I looked up and saw my doom barreling towards me. And then, there was gunfire. Not from me, but from the direction of the tree line. More shots rang out, sending the creature staggering backward as it howled in rage and, I swear, confusion. A figure emerged from the darkness carrying some fancy-looking rifle too far to make out in the gloom. The mysterious stranger continued to fire, and I took the opportunity to scramble back to my wrecked cruiser, fumbling with the radio. This is Deputy Coleman. Unknown creature attacking. Shots fired at the Jackson farm, need. The figure was moving forward now, gun raised, closing the distance toward that thing. My backup was still minutes away. This was going to be over before they got here. Suddenly, I heard Sarah's voice crackle over the radio. Never been happier to hear my wife nagging me about dinner in my life. Jeff? What's going on out there? You sound... She never got a chance to finish. A blood-curdling screech, inhuman in its intensity, filled the air. The radio went dead. I pounded on the dash, voice hoarse. Sarah? Sarah, answer me. No response, just an endless crackle of static. Blind terror slammed into me. That thing was going for my house, for Sarah, for my boys. With a roar of fury, I slammed the cruiser into gear and tore down the dirt road back towards town. The drive felt like an eternity each second twisting the knife of dread deeper. Finally, our modest house came into view. Everything looked intact from a distance, but I knew better than to trust my eyes. I parked across the street, gun out, heart thundering. I crept toward the house, my ears straining for the slightest sound. Nothing. Eerily, the front door stood slightly ajar. I eased the door open, the smell of copper hitting me like a wave. No sign of Sarah or the boys, but there was a trail of blood leading deeper into the house. My throat closed up. I followed it, my every step echoing in the silent house. The trail led to our bedroom. My breath hitched in my throat. The door was splintered inward, the wood scattered across the floor, covered in more blood and deep claw marks gouged into the wood. I pushed the door open, rifle raised, ready for anything, and found nothing. The room was empty. A wave of despair hit me with a force that nearly sent me to my knees. They were gone. That creature took my family. No, I choked out, my voice raw with grief. No way. But that's when I heard it. A faint whimper coming from under the bed. My heart leapt with a flicker of desperate hope. I dropped to my knees, aiming my flashlight into the darkness. There they were. My boys huddled together, their eyes wide with terror. I scrambled under the bed, pulling them into my arms. Their tears fell hot on my face as I held them tight, whispering apologies for not being there to protect them. Sarah was nowhere to be seen. My heart sank, but I had to keep it together. The boys needed me. We had to get out of there, find help, anywhere that was safe. I lifted myself up, still cradling my children close. That's when I saw it. Sarah's phone, lying cracked and forgotten under the edge of the nightstand. She must have dropped it when the thing attacked. A sliver of hope. If she was still alive, she might have tried to call for help. I reached for the phone, my trembling fingers tapping the screen. The battery was nearly dead, but the call history showed one outgoing call, the sheriff's department. 
I jammed the phone to my ear, praying. Hello? Sheriff's Department, this is dispatch. How can I help you? It was Carol, the dispatcher. Good. Carol was tough, unflappable. I took a deep, steadying breath then poured out my story. The creature at the farmhouse. The attack on my home. My missing wife. I'm sure I sounded unhinged, but Carol's voice remained crisp and professional. Deputy Coleman, stay where you are. We have units on the way, including animal control. Sit. I didn't need instructions. I had my orders. Carol, my voice cracked with desperation. Listen, whatever that thing is, animal control isn't gonna cut it. Deputy Coleman, it might be a bear dash. It's not a bear, Carol. You need to send everyone you've got, and for the love of God, tell them to come armed. There was a silence on the line, then Carol's voice, a touch hesitant. Deputy Coleman, I understand you're upset, but we need to stick to protocol. Damn your protocol! I exploded, guilt twisting through me. Should I stay here with my terrified sons? But if I waited for backup, that creature could be anywhere, hunting Sarah. I made my choice. Get those units out there now, I said, my voice tight with command. I'm going after it. Before Carol could respond, I ended the call, pocketed the phone, and gently set my boys back down. They looked up at me eyes filled with fear and a glimmer of trust. Stay here, lock the door, don't open for anyone but the police, understand? I choked out. My oldest nodded, clutching his brother close. I wanted to stay, to protect them, but Sarah needed me more. Kissing each boy on the head, I turned and bolted for my cruiser. It was time to hunt. The drive back to the old Jackson place felt impossibly long, each mile fueled by rage and fear. The road was crawling with police vehicles, headlights flashing, sirens wailing. I skidded to a stop, nearly crashing into an animal control van. Chaos. Dozens of officers and animal control personnel milled around the dark farmhouse illuminated only by the harsh glow of headlights and flashlights. Their faces were a blur of confusion and barely concealed fear. One face stood out, though, the stranger with the rifle. He was talking to a group of officers, his back to me. He was tall, his shoulders broad under a weathered hunting jacket. I pushed through the crowd, my legs pumping on pure adrenaline. As I approached, he turned, and my breath hitched in my throat. He was young. Couldn't have been more than twenty. I shoved that shock down. Age didn't matter. He saved my life. You! I barked, my voice rough. You the one who was shooting at that thing? The kid looked at me, his eyes narrowed. Then he simply nodded a flicker of recognition crossing his face. I stuck out my hand. Deputy Coleman. He hesitated, then took it. His grip was firm. Name's Luke. Jeff. Look, we don't have time for niceties. It took my wife. I need your help to track it down. Luke's eyes widened in surprise. Then, a grim line tightened his jaw. He nodded slowly. All right, deputy. Let's get hunting. The hunt led us into the woods behind the farmhouse. The beams of flashlights danced and weaved, cutting through the darkness. Luke moved with practiced silence, every sense honed on the task at hand. I tried to keep up, my mind racing ahead, conjuring up horrific images of what might have happened to Sarah. We followed a trail easy enough to spot, broken branches, blood splatters, gouges torn into the bark by giant claws. This thing was powerful, but sloppy. It was leaving a path right to its doorstep. 
I found myself trusting Luke. His calm focus was infectious. We moved together in a wordless rhythm, covering ground quickly. The deeper into the woods we went, the tenser I wound. Every rustle, every snap of a branch set my teeth on edge. Luke froze suddenly, holding up a fist. I went still, then saw it. A dark shape lay sprawled on the ground ahead. You think, I choked out, hope battling with dread. Luke shook his head, then signaled for me to follow. We approached cautiously, rifles ready. As we got closer, my worst fears were confirmed. It wasn't Sarah. It was a deer, savaged and torn to shreds. My stomach turned. If the creature could do this to a deer, what had it done to my wife? A wave of sick despair washed over me. I wanted to turn away, but Luke forged ahead, examining the carcass with clinical precision. Tracks, he grunted. Fresh. It's close. I nodded grimly, pushing down another wave of nausea. We resumed our pursuit, the creature's trail of death leading us further into the heart of the woods. Finally, the stench hit me, a sickly metallic odor of blood and something else I didn't want to define. My flashlight beam cut through the tangle of trees, and I saw it, a cave mouth, its dark entrance gaping wide. Even from a distance, I could make out the splatter of fresh blood across the rough stone. This was it. Its lair. I swallowed hard, fear clawing at my insides. Sarah could be in there, alive or... I wouldn't let myself finish that thought. Luke met my gaze, his young face set in grim determination. We can't go in blind. He reached into his pack and pulled out something that looked like a military walkie-talkie, but with way more dials and switches. Thermal camera. Let's us pick up heat signatures. He pressed a few buttons then lifted the device to scan the cave entrance. There. See that? He pointed towards a readout on the device. A large, amorphous blob glowed brightly on the screen, pulsating irregularly. My heart pounded in my chest. That was it, the creature, lurking in its den. I turned to Luke, my words laced with desperation. She could be in there, alive. We need a plan. Luke nodded, already deep in thought. It's big, too strong for a head-on fight. We need to draw it out, catch it in the open. He laid out the plan, a simple yet calculated scheme. I'd circle around and position myself across from the cave mouth, armed and ready. Luke would go in, make some noise, flush the creature out. Hopefully it would charge and we could hit it from two sides. It was risky, reckless even, but it was the only chance we had. Leaving Sarah to die in that beast's den wasn't an option. As we split up, I felt a surge of gratitude for this strange kid who'd materialized out of the darkness, armed with a fancy rifle and a willingness to risk his own hide right alongside me. I crept through the undergrowth, my boots barely making a sound on the forest floor. The cave loomed ahead, its stench intensifying with each step. I took my position, settling low to the ground, rifle trembling in my sweaty hands. My pulse roared in my ears, drowning out the night sounds until there was only my ragged breathing and the thudding of my own heart. Then there it was, a low growl rising from the cave echoing through the trees. Luke was doing his part. My knuckles ached from how hard I was gripping my rifle. And then it burst from the cave, a blur of matted fur and glistening fangs. The creature was charging straight for me. I fired, the rifle bucking hard against my shoulder. The shots made it flinch, but it kept coming. I fired again and again the smell of cordite filling my nostrils. My ears rang, every instinct screaming at me to run, but I held my ground. 
This was it, my chance to end this monster, to save Sarah. Suddenly, another shot rang out from my left. The creature staggered, a howl of rage ripping from its throat. Luke was in position, firing relentlessly. It turned its massive head towards him, momentarily confused, giving me the opening I needed. I took a breath, calmed my aim, and fired a final shot. It hit the creature square in the chest. Blood sprayed, and its roar cut off in a choking gurgle. It stumbled, then crashed to the ground with a final groan that shook the trees around us. For a dizzying moment, there was only silence and the pounding of my own heart. Slowly, cautiously, Luke and I approached the creature. It was immense, even in death. Its eyes had glazed over, the malevolent spark finally extinguished. My legs nearly gave out in relief. Then, a noise from the cave a ragged sob. Sarah! I was a blur of motion, scrambling towards the dark cave entrance. Luke right behind me. We stumbled into the cave, our flashlights desperately cutting through the gloom. There, huddled in a far corner, was Sarah battered and bloody but alive. I rushed to her, scooping her into my arms. Relief washed over me in hot waves, then shame, shame that I'd ever doubted she was strong enough to survive. In the chaos that followed, everything blurs together. The paramedics tending to Sarah, Luke quietly slipping back into the darkness before anyone could question him, animal control wrestling with the monstrous corpse outside. There were explanations, endless questions, but I blocked most of it out focused only on Sarah and the miracle of finding her alive. The aftermath, as they liked to call it, wasn't easy. Willow Grove was never the same quiet little town again. Sightings of strange creatures continued, whispered stories passed down by wide-eyed children. The official report? Rabid bear attack, of course. Easier for folks to swallow. Sarah recovered physically, but some wounds run deeper. I'd like to say knowing what was really out there changed me, made me braver. Truth is, sometimes I lie awake at night and listen to the creak of the floorboards, remembering the moment those blood-soaked claws ripped through them, remembering the creature that almost ripped my family apart. As for Luke, well, I never saw him again. Sometimes, I hike out to the cave, just to be sure it's still empty. People think I'm crazy, but they don't know. They don't know that a stranger with a rifle and a steady hand saved our lives that night and then vanished back into the darkness. A part of me hopes he's okay out there, whatever he is, wherever he ends up. A part of me knows he's more than okay. He's a hunter in the shadows, out there keeping people like me safe from the things that go bump in the night. This happened to me on June 6, 1999. I was a rookie cop, still green behind the ears, working the night shift out in Ashton. It's one of those blink and you'll miss it towns tucked in the foothills of the Ozarks, more known for catfish, noodling than crime scenes. Name's Eli Turner. Wife Amy is a nurse, and we had our first baby girl on the way. Point is, I had a lot to live for and a whole lot to lose. That night began like any other. Betty ends diner for my usual coffee and gossip fix, few traffic stops, nothing to raise an eyebrow. Then, around 2 a.m., it got weird. Dispatch crackled to life. A woman, hysterical, rambling about some kind of monster in the woods just off Route 9. At first, I chalked it up to a wild animal, meth head antics, or both. Still, protocol is protocol, I headed out there to investigate. The spot she mentioned was a stretch of unpaved road twisting through a dense stretch of forest, 
dark as pitch except for my cruiser headlights. I could feel the prickly unease on the back of my neck. I radioed for backup, but who knows how long it would take to get to my backwater patch. I got out, flashlight in one hand, gun in the other. The air was still and the woods eerily silent. And then I saw them two glowing eyes reflecting the flashlight beam about twenty feet into the tree lean. They were unlike any animal's eyes I'd ever encountered, huge and a strange, acid yellow color. Heart pounding, I edged closer. The form the eyes belonged to started to come into focus, and my blood ran cold. It stood on two legs like a person, but the proportions were all wrong. It was immense, easily over seven feet tall, covered in a coarse, dark gray hide. Its legs and arms were powerfully muscled, ending in vicious claws. The head, that's what really stuck with me. Like a warped, monstrous wolf, with a huge gaping jaw filled with razor-sharp teeth. It let out a low growl, the sound vibrating through me. Frozen by a mixture of fear and utter disbelief, I stood there like an idiot, the flashlight shaking in my hand. Then it lunged. I barely registered raising my gun before I was firing, the sound echoing through the woods. The bullets must have hit something because it roared in pain and lurched backwards. I took the opportunity and ran like hell back to the cruiser. Slamming the door, I threw it into reverse and spun the wheel. As I tore back down the dirt road, I glanced in the rearview mirror. The creature was gaining fast, its yellow eyes blazing with fury. It was easily keeping pace, its form a blur in the darkness. Knowing I couldn't outrun that thing forever, I wrenched the steering wheel, swerving the car down a side track barely wider than the cruiser itself. I fishtailed through the trees, the branches scraping at the sides of the vehicle. Sweat dripped down my forehead as I prayed the narrow path wouldn't end in a dead end, leaving me trapped. Luckily, it spat me out onto a rarely used logging road. I pressed the accelerator hard, but I was running on fumes. Suddenly, the engine sputtered, coughed, and died. I slammed the heel of my hand against the dashboard in frustration. The damn thing chose now to run out of gas. A glance in the mirror and my stomach dropped. The creature was closing the gap rapidly. It was practically flying over the ground, its long strides devouring the distance, and those horrible eyes locked on my taillights. Panic clawed at my sanity. I couldn't just sit here and wait for it to tear me to shreds. Grabbing my flashlight... I stumbled out of the car and into the woods. I knew it was a fool's errand, that the dense trees offered little protection, but blind instinct took over. As expected, the monster's snarls echoed through the trees as it tracked me. I ran until my lungs burned, branches and thorns tearing at my skin. Just when I thought I couldn't go another step, I tripped, tumbling down a sharp embankment. I rolled until I smacked into a tree trunk hard enough to knock the breath out of me. Dazed, I lay there waiting for the beast to descend and rip me apart. But silence greeted me instead. I cautiously lifted my head, heart pounding in my ears. Had it given up? Then I heard it the unmistakable sound of sirens in the distance. My backup was finally arriving, drawn by the gunshots. A wave of relief washed over me, then promptly receded as something else dawned on me. They were going to find my cruiser wrecked and abandoned. And in these woods, who knew what kind of wild story I'd have to spin to avoid them locking me up in the psych ward. With renewed resolve, I struggled to my feet. Every muscle in my body ached but I had to put as much distance between me and that embankment as possible before the cavalry arrived. Stumbling along, guided more by blind luck than anything else, I somehow made my way back to the logging road. Dawn was breaking as I limped back to Ashton. 
I must have looked a sight disheveled, clothes ripped, covered in dirt and blood mine, hopefully. My story to dispatch was a mumbled mess about chasing a meth head into the woods and losing him. They clearly thought I was either lying or delusional. But I was alive, and for that, I was grateful. Aftermath the incident changed me. The townsfolk of Ashton started calling me Monster Cop, a mix of ridicule and unease in their voices. After a while, the stares and whispers got too much. Amy and I packed up our things, our baby girl only a few months old then, and headed west. We put down roots in a dusty little town in Nevada. Life carried on, though I never spoke of that night to anyone, not even Amy. But it haunts me. Sometimes, lying awake in the dark, I see those eyes, the monstrous form. I wonder if it was a nightmare made reality. A creature of legend somehow stumbled into the backwaters of the Ozarks. Or worse, perhaps the stress cracked something in my mind, and the monster I saw was me. Years passed. Our daughters grew up, and the Ashton nightmare started to fade into a bizarre memory. Then, one night, I came home to find Amy sitting at the kitchen table, face pale. Did you see this? she asked, her voice shaking. She slid a local newspaper over to me. There, under a sensational headline, was a blurry photo of a massive, wolf-like creature and a story about a series of mysterious livestock mutilations. The locations were all within a few hours' drive of our old home in Ashton. A chill ran down my spine. Could it be? Was the monster still out there? I'm a cop, damn it. I'm meant to protect people. Could I sit idly by if others were facing the same horror that almost tore my life apart? After so long, could I go back and face it down once more? I don't have any answers yet. But one thing is for sure. There's unfinished business waiting for me back in the Ozarks. This whole thing's one big mess. You hear all of those campfire stories about what lurks in the wilderness, but most people brush them off. Me? I used to chuckle at them myself. Now, well, it feels like all those jokes are on me. My name's Elias, and let me tell you what happened out there in the main woods. It makes my blood run cold just thinking back on it. I work a desk job, the nine-to-five type. It pays the bills, but it's about as exciting as watching paint dry. When my uncle passed, though, he left me his old cabin. Turns out, he always dreamed of retiring someplace secluded, up in the north woods near the Canadian border. Now, my wife Sarah and I aren't much the adventuring type, but hey, free property is free property. We decided to use it as a little summer getaway. The first few trips were all about fixing it up and getting reacquainted with nature. You know, grilling by the lake, swatting mosquitoes. The usual. Things started to shift right before our fourth trip a couple of weeks ago. We arrived in the evening, a little later than intended. As soon as we turned onto the dirt road leading to the cabin, we got this feeling that something was off. You can barely see anything by moonlight, but it seemed like the woods were just denser, heavier. That night, I didn't sleep well. I swore I heard something snuffling outside the cabin, but Sarah called me paranoid and told me to go back to sleep. In the morning, we took a quick stroll down to the lake. When we looked across the water, I froze. Something tall and dark had moved just before I turned my head. There was something huge lurking over there, but just barely in sight. We booked it back to the cabin and didn't leave its walls for the rest of the day. My first mistake was calling Sarah's suggestion to bail, irrational. When you're faced with the unknown, your brain can mess with you. 
When we saw it the next day, there was no room for denial. We'd gone to the end of the property to clear some of the brush that seemed to creep closer each time we visited. I was down at the tree line with the clippers in hand when this massive figure stepped into view. Sarah gasped and dropped the bag she carried. My mind still struggles to understand it even now. Standing up like a person on giant, muscled legs, this creature, it looked at us. Sarah screamed. That kind of high-pitched sound only real terror can pull out of you. The worst part is, for just a heartbeat, it met our eyes. That intelligence, that cold stare, it's burned into my brain for life. Then, just when I thought we were done for, it pivoted and disappeared back into the forest. Sarah stumbled backward and almost collapsed if I hadn't grabbed her just in time. I remember her sobbing and repeating nonsense over and over. From there, our survival instincts kicked in. We got back inside the cabin, slammed the door shut. Panic attacks and fumbling attempts to barricade the windows were next. My mind tried to convince itself that it was a trick of the eye, a black bear on its hind legs, anything to cling to reason. But that's when we heard the thud against the back of the house. Something big had bumped into the wall. Then the scratching started. Not like an animal, not desperate scrabbling. These sounds were more deliberate, purposeful. At one point, the creature walked around the entire cabin as if studying its weak points. We sat trembling on the couch, holding each other for what we thought were our final moments. I even had Sarah call her family and say a rushed goodbye. It was too loud for them to hear anything on the other side of the line. As quickly as it began, the noise stopped. Silence. For hours. Finally, exhaustion set in, and we dozed off in a fitful sleep. We waited until well after daybreak to peek out the window. There was no sign of anything disturbed around the cabin. Maybe I'd hallucinated all of it. Maybe, but when I went out onto the porch, I found something chilling. Footprints. Gigantic, wide-spaced footprints with deep claw marks gouged into the earth. I've stared at them countless times since then, replaying the nightmare in my head. Those tracks left the yard and stretched all the way back into the woods. Now you may wonder why we just didn't run into town and tell the nearest ranger. I wanted to. Really, I did. But I couldn't bear to go out there, not even an inch, not after that. What had we encountered? And worse, what if it waited for us? We rationed our last granola bars for the two agonizing days it took for Sarah's sister, Amelia, to come get us. We called to explain what happened, what we'd seen. She must have thought we lost our minds completely. I don't blame her. Since then, the cabin sits empty. There's no way we're going back to that cursed place. You could call me a coward. You could say we should have alerted the authorities or something of the sort. But some things defy logic. Sarah can barely say what she saw let alone go to the police and risk sounding insane. We just keep talking ourselves in circles, wondering if anyone would ever believe a word of it. People talk about those creatures, Sasquatches, they call them, but for anyone who truly understands, even their name hardly fits what we encountered in the woods that day. That thing, it was far too intelligent for its monstrous appearance too deliberate in its actions. We had been observed, measured, maybe even judged. There's something out in those trees, waiting, watching. The real tragedy is, even if we screamed it from the highest mountain, most folks just wouldn't understand the true weight of our terror. This happened to me a few years back. Back then, 
all my buddies bragged about their crazy outdoor adventures I wanted a piece of that. Finding yourself in nature, vibe everyone talks about. See, the truth is my job as a programmer is boring at best and soul-sucking at worst. Living in Seattle well, let's just say I'm more the tech guy than the lumberjack type. Still, when my friend Eamon suggested hitting up Olympic National Forest for a long weekend of camping, it didn't feel like too much of a stretch. My name is Zaire, by the way. An old family name. Kind of ironic I didn't pick up more about our heritage that might have prepped me for what went down. Anyway, Eamon is this outdoor gear freak. All those high-tech tents, water purifiers, the works. With him handling the equipment, I felt okay being a rookie about actually surviving in the woods. Now, Olympic National Forest is no joke. They've got it all. Giant trees, glaciers, rainforests, you name it. It's an amazing place, and the start of the trip was genuinely relaxing. Eamon even tried showing me how to fish from one of those picture-perfect streams. He caught a few but all mine got away, figures. Anyway, as time passed, I noticed him getting tense when it came to picking trails Eamon's this big, happy teddy bear of a guy, and seeing him hesitate seemed off. Finally, when I called him on it, he told me there were sections of the forest he considered risky. Eamon talked about poachers not out for trophies, mind you, but growers. The forest is remote so some set up hidden illegal marijuana plots the kind likely protected by guys we'd rather not meet. His stories had that tinge of urban legend you think is mostly exaggerated, but hearing them in the shadowy green depths with night approaching had the hairs on my arm standing on end. Next morning Eamon seemed determined to stick to well-marked trails. It took the fun out of exploring, but even I saw how easy it would be to lose our way, GPS or not. Late afternoon, we made camp near a river, idyllic spot, the whole deal. Only that night Eamon insisted on sleeping in shifts, saying wild animals weren't his main concern. Honestly, after his earlier paranoia, even I started getting spooked. His shift started sometime past midnight, the fire still going strong. It woke me, that weird sense of silence despite the crackle of flames. It wasn't long before I figured out why. Eamon was gone. There was no note, no. Woke up for bathroom break. Explanation. He just disappeared. In a rising panic, I scanned the campsite. His gear remained where I remembered. Everything seemed in order. I called out his name, the sound swallowed by the forest darkness. It wasn't like Eamon to run off irresponsibly, but neither was his poacher talk typical. Did somebody, something, get him? My pulse thundered, fear taking over any rational thought. I grabbed a pocket knife, yes, pathetically inadequate against an armed grower, and plunged into the undergrowth, my shouts becoming increasingly desperate. I stumbled in a direction, any direction, looking for signs of movement or struggle. Then my heart lurched. I saw a crumpled shape nestled amidst the tree roots. At first, it was pure relief, Amen. Then I saw something else, dark and pooling around him, blood. He was still breathing, but it was choked, gurgling sounds. There was more blood seeping from gashes that crisscrossed his arms. As I got a closer look, another horrific detail emerged one leg was twisted grotesquely. I knelt beside him, voice shaking, trying to figure out if we could move, where even to go. His eyes flickered open, confusion swirling. Then I saw them focus behind me, pure fear replacing whatever haze had clouded his mind. He tried to gasp out a warning, but only a wet sputter emerged. That's when I noticed why Eamon looked past me what lurked between the massive redwood trunks. A man. No, a man-like thing, 
covered in rags that could barely be called clothing. He loomed tall and broad, a wild beard obscuring most of his face. One hand held a thick, blood-stained stick, the other. There was another weapon tucked into his waistband. It glinted under the starlight. But my fear out of brain didn't process exactly what it was. What I did catch was his movement, deliberate and predatory, closing the distance towards us. This creature wasn't afraid. Even the flickering fire didn't give him pause. I looked back at Eamon. He mouthed. Run! That desperate warning finally pushing my frozen muscles into action. There was no thought, just wild scramble backwards, crashing through leaves and bushes as the rasping sound at my back increased. That creature was gaining. I caught a glimpse of Eamon trying to push himself upright, to distract or stall the axe seemed so hopeless given its sheer size and brutality. Then my foot struck a tangle of roots. I hit the forest floor hard, the air knocked out of me. There was the sickening thud of impact a split second later likely not on me, thank God. I crawled desperately, scrambling and slipping on the moist earth. Then, in that awful moment, light appeared ahead. Not from the campfire, too bright for that, car headlights. A road! Eamon mentioned a back route nearby. In a burst of final adrenaline, I lunged. Somehow, I made it out, collapsed and sobbing just as a vehicle turned on that stretch of road. It took effort, and the sight of my bloody hands, to convince the driver I wasn't the attacker. It all went crazy fast. Emergency calls, paramedics, me babbling a nonsensical story. Eventually, they found Eamon. Broken leg, internal damage, some infection from the cuts it sounded gruesome enough, but he lived. Cops questioned us, searched, never found any growers, and I'm sure a bit of me whispering about a wild hermit made them discount all of it. Eamon and I drifted apart after that. The horror didn't end my nightmares are relentless, vivid. If Eamon feels the same, well... It's no surprise we didn't try sharing it. Some folks suggest getting counseling, they tell me. Talk it out. Honestly, it feels less about processing it than worrying that whatever was stalking us is still out there in that vast, unforgiving landscape. It feels like an open wound. The only way to scab over is to never, ever go back into those woods. This happened to me on November 8, 2009. Name's Caden, search and rescue up in the forests of northern Michigan. Been doing this job since I could walk woods feel like home, or at least they used to. Got called out to a missing person's case. Two college kids, Bryce and Kaylee, went out on a weekend trip to a remote cabin, never made it back. Their friends got worried raised the alarm. Figured they were just young, maybe ran out of gas or got turned around. Happens a lot with those out-of-towners underestimating how thick the woods get up here. Drove out, found their car abandoned near an old logging road. Started hiking in, hoping it was nothing more than a sprained ankle and a call for help. Fall had already set in, so I knew I didn't have long before nightfall. The air had that crisp, smoky smell of rotting leaves and damp earth that used to bring a sense of peace, but now it just felt heavy, oppressive. After about an hour, I hit a weird clearing. Place was littered with bones, big ones. Didn't look like deer or anything I was used to. Found some shredded clothing tangled in the brush, and a camera smashed on the ground. My unease was growing with every step. That's when the smell hit me, a mix of rot, iron, and something I couldn't identify. Like wild animal, but sharper, fouler. My stomach lurched, but I pushed down the dread. My job wasn't to get spooked easily, 
It was to find those kids. The tracks were what made me freeze. They weren't human, or any animal I recognized. These prints were huge, each toe splayed out ending in unnatural, hooked claws. My first instinct was a bear, but bears don't make tracks like that. Dread turned to icy fear coiling in my gut. I followed them, heart pounding, gun drawn, into the deepening shadows of the trees. The silence was unnerving. Not even the usual rustle of squirrels or birdsong to break the tension. Just the crunch of dead leaves under my boots and my own ragged breath. I stumbled on Bryce first. What was left of him, anyway? It was wrong. Bones twisted like they shouldn't, flesh torn in a disturbing, precise way, like someone had meticulously disassembled him. The sight stole the breath from my lungs. I tried to call it in, but nothing came from my radio but static. Panic started to rise in my throat. Where was Kaylee? Then I heard a scream, a girl's scream, cut short. I took off running, following the sound deeper into the woods. When I reached the source, bow rose in my throat. Kaylee was strung up between two trees, her body. It was like she'd been pulled apart, limbs wrenched at unnatural angles, entrails hanging loose. Her eyes were open, staring in absolute horror. That's when I saw it. Hulking in the shadows, impossibly tall and thin. Its skin was leathery, clinging to a bone-white frame. The face, it had a long, jagged muzzle full of teeth like needles, dripping with saliva. But it was the eyes that made me want to scream. Empty sockets, glowing with a cold, yellow light, filled with a hunger that seemed to twist and churn from some ancient, bottomless pit. It took a step towards me, and a guttural growl rose from deep within its chest. I fumbled for my gun, fired, the shots echoing through the trees. The creature didn't even flinch. I turned and ran blind terror propelling me. I tripped, fell hard, heard its rasping breath growing closer, the stench of decay filling my nostrils. It was going to play with me, I knew that. It was going to, a gunshot cracked the air. The creature shrieked, and I heard it crashing off into the undergrowth. I scrambled to my feet, saw another figure rushing towards me, it was another ranger, Novak, out on patrol. He'd heard my shots and come running. His eyes were wide, face pale. Had he seen it too? We got back to the station, bodies recovered, and they wrote it down as a bear attack. Mangler bears, they called them, the ones that got so desperate they turned on humans. But Novak, he looked at me like he knew like he saw the same thing I did in the woods that day. That wasn't a bear. It was something else, something old and hungry, a thing that shouldn't exist. Took some time off after that. Didn't go into the deep woods alone for a long, long time. Don't know if I ever will again. Sometimes, late at night, I still feel those glowing eyes on me, hot and hateful. Folks around here talk about the Wendigo, an old Native American legend of a starved spirit that stalks the forests. Maybe that's what I saw. Maybe it's always been there, hiding, waiting, and we're just a prey that wanders into its path. The rest of the folks on the search and rescue crew, they give me a wide berth now. I get the hushed whispers, the knowing glances. Maybe they think I'm crazy and some days I almost think that myself. But then the nightmares come creeping back, the snapping of branches, Bryce's twisted body, those burning yellow eyes. I start remembering that smell, an unholy mix of rotting meat and something cold and metallic, and I know deep down, I know what I saw. The woods, they feel different now. The comforting smell of pine and earth is tainted with the memory of that iron tang of fear. Sometimes, standing at the edge of the old forest trails, 
A part of me wants to go back in, wants to find that creature and end it once and for all. Another part, the part that wants to live, keeps me rooted to the spot. Whatever it is, I don't think it can be killed, not by anything a man can carry. This happened to me on July 14, 2016. I'm Jonah, search and rescue in Yellowstone. Been patrolling these woods since I was old enough to hold a compass. Figured nobody knew them better than me. Lately, though, I'm not so sure. Got the call about a missing hiker early afternoon, Amelia, a solo traveler who never checked in with her family the night before. Started on her trailhead, found her car still parked there. Figured it was the usual scenario twisted ankle. Maybe she got turned around at some unmarked junction. Happens out here more often than you'd think. The trail wound deeper into the forest, the air thick and still under the summer sun. Found her pack about a mile in, ripped open, supplies thrown everywhere. No signs of a struggle, but something felt off. That's when I saw it, a smear of blood on a tree trunk, dark streaks against the moss. My training kicked in, Years of practice overcoming my first instinct to turn tail and run. Tracked the blood further into the woods. Then I found Amelia. I'll spare you the details. There's a reason we're trained on how to tell the families, and none of the words make it any easier. But what got to me, what chills me to the bone, was the way she was, arranged as the closest word I can stomach. Limbs bent at impossible angles, her skin stretched taut and pale, her eyes wide and staring, frozen in a scream that would never leave her throat. It was like something had taken her apart and put her back together wrong, just to see if it could. Then the silence of the forest shattered as a twig snapped nearby. I whirled around, rifle raised, and saw it. Standing just inside the tree line, almost invisible in the dappled shade, was the most unnatural thing I have ever encountered. It must have been ten feet tall, thin as a skeleton, skin stretched tight over bone. The head was all wrong, narrow, elongated, with a muzzle filled with sharp teeth. But the worst were the eyes. Hollow, black, yet burning with a predatory intelligence that made me feel less like a hunter and more like prey. For one terrifying, heart-pounding second, we locked eyes. Then it lunged forward with inhuman speed, and I ran. Branches tore at me, but I kept going, fueled by blind terror. It was behind me, its long, spindly legs carrying it silently over the forest floor. I could hear its ragged breathing, the clicking of those unnatural claws against the rocks, smell its fetid, rotten breath. Then, a gunshot rang out. The creature shrieked, and for a second, I dared to hope. My backup team raced into the clearing, and as the creature melted back into the trees, I collapsed to the ground, gasping for air, unable to stop the shaking. The official report said Amelia was killed by a bear, or maybe a mountain lion. They told the family they'd scared it off before it could mutilate the body any further. They gave me a long look when I insisted on describing the figure I saw, that too tall silhouette and those burning black eyes. Offered stress leave, counseling, the whole routine for folks who finally lost their grip on reality. I almost took them up on the offer, too. Sometimes, in the dead of night, I feel like I should have. It's hard to look at a map of Yellowstone and not picture that thing lurking among the trees, its impossible shape blending seamlessly with the shadows. They whisper tales like that in the local bar's stories of hunters vanished without a trace, hikers found broken and twisted deep within the woods. Stories about the strider, they call it, 
a predator too cunning and too unnatural for anyone to catch a clear glimpse of. Maybe I was supposed to fade away, write it off as trauma, leave the woods behind. But something in me, something stubborn and more than a little afraid, wouldn't let me. Instead, I stayed. I patrol my roots with a new sense of unease, always glancing over my shoulder and into the trees. I check the tree lean before stepping into clearings, flinch at every snap of a branch. But there's a defiance in there too, a refusal to become another victim, another name whispered in hushed tones around a campfire. I haven't seen the strider since that day, but I know it hasn't forgotten me. Out there in the vastness of Yellowstone, under the ancient trees and silent sky, it waits. It remembers my fear, and it's patient. It knows I'll be walking its trails again, knows there'll be another hiker gone astray, another call that I'll have to answer. And when that day comes, when the forest falls silent and my footsteps lead me too deep into the shadowed woods, maybe it'll finally come to finish the hunt. This happened to me on July 4, 2001, back when I thought I'd seen it all. My name's Rick Donovan. Search and rescue in Yosemite National Park for the past 10 years. Folks don't realize a national park ain't just a big playground. It's untamed, and there are things out there that wouldn't think twice about having you for lunch. This particular summer, we had a rash of missing hikers. It started small. A young couple didn't return from a day hike, then an elderly lady out picking wildflowers just vanished. The usual theories floated around, accidents, maybe even foul play. But in the back of my mind, something prickled. Those disappearances fell off, the woods humming with a kind of wrongness. Then came the call about Jason and Emily Fuller, honeymooners from Texas, eager to explore Yosemite's splendor. Last seen heading toward Vernal Falls, one of the easier trails. I partnered up with Carter, a rookie, but keen. Armed with our gear and a good dose of skepticism, we set out. The trail wound us through a thick pine forest the sun filtering through the dense canopy in dappled patches of light. City folk always seem surprised at how quiet it gets out there, like the world itself is holding its breath. Carter and I chatted, the usual stuff about sports and whether or not his wife would let him get that new fishing boat. About halfway to the falls, I spotted something. A flash of color snagged on a low-hanging branch. It was a scrap of fabric, a bright, flowery pattern that screamed tourist. It matched the description of Emily Fuller's dress. My heartbeat quickened. Not a good sign. We pushed on, the ground rising beneath our feet. The forest began to thin, and the roar of the waterfall grew louder with each step. Then the trail split. One fork toward the falls, the other... It vanished into a dense thicket of manzanita bushes and scrub oak. Odd. It wasn't on any official map. Carter pointed at the makeshift trail. Think they wandered off the beaten path? I chewed my lip, unease gnawing at me. Maybe. Let's check out the falls first, spread out from there. We reached the base of the waterfall its spray kicking up a cool mist that felt good against our sweaty faces. No sign of the fullers. Now worry was clawing its way up my throat. I gestured toward the thicket, the entrance a gaping shadow amidst the bright green foliage. Let's give this a look-see, I said, keeping my voice steady. We plunged in, branches snapping back in our wake. The makeshift trail was rough, the ground uneven. It twisted deeper and deeper into the dense growth, the waterfall's roar fading behind us. The air felt heavy, stagnant. 
A prickle ran down my spine, the sense of being watched intensifying with every step. Creepy in here, ain't it? Carter muttered, his voice low. Keep your eyes peeled, I replied, pushing back a wave of unease. Lost folks don't usually bushwhack into the heart of nowhere. Then we found it. A clearing, not a natural one. The manzanita bushes were hacked and torn, the ground trampled in a rough circle. And in the center, well, that's when my world tilted on its axis. They were bones, human bones. They were picked clean. Something in that moment, a flicker of primal terror, told me this was not the work of a mountain lion. Rick, Carter's voice was barely a whisper. He didn't need to say more. My radio crackled to life. It was base camp, their voices tight with urgency. More missing persons reported, last seen near Verna Falls. My blood ran cold. Whatever was out there, it was hungry. I made the decision right then. Carter, radio it in. Full evacuation of the trail. Get everyone back, now. He sprinted back the way we came, his boots kicking up dust. I was alone, the only thing between that clearing and whoever was heading back towards civilization. I drew my gun, the weight of it a cold comfort. The weight was excruciating. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, had my heart hammering. That's when I saw it. Not the creature, just its handiwork. A fresh blood trail smeared across the low-hanging leaves. Something had dragged a body this way, recently. I followed it, my gut twisting. Then the trees broke, and I stumbled out into a second clearing, much larger than the first. And that's where I saw it. The creature was hunched over something, a fresh carcass, the remnants of whoever had been unlucky enough to cross its path. I couldn't look away. It was immense, easily twice the size of a bear, its fur patchy and matted, revealing glimpses of mottled gray skin. Its limbs were too long, its hands tipped with claws that could tear through flesh like tissue paper. But it was the head, that elongated, wolfish skull, the jaw dripping with blood, and the eyes. Those eyes burned a sulfurous yellow, devoid of anything remotely human. It lifted its head, and our gazes locked. Time seemed to freeze. In that instant, I became nothing more than prey. A guttural snarl ripped from its throat. The world exploded into action. I fired my gun, the shots echoing through the clearing. The creature lunged, its speed defying its size. I dove to the side, rolling for cover behind a fallen log. It shrieked in rage, swiping a massive paw and shredding the rotten wood like paper. I was on my feet, running blind, heart pounding a frantic drumbeat against my ribs. Branches tore at my clothes and skin, but I didn't slow down. Behind me, I heard the creature crashing through the undergrowth, its snarls growing closer with each passing second. My lungs burned with the exertion, my vision blurring. Then, a flicker of hope, the main trail. I burst from the undergrowth, scrambling for the dirt path. Salvation, maybe? If I could make it to the falls, the crowds. Surely, it wouldn't attack in plain sight. The creature erupted from the bushes behind me, a monstrous shadow against the fading light. I was running on pure adrenaline now, legs carrying me forward on instinct. The waterfall roared in my ears, growing louder with each desperate stride. And then I tripped. A stray root snagged my boot, and I went sprawling, my gun flying from my hand. I scrambled to my feet, terror lending me a final burst of speed. The falls, only a few yards. It was on me in a heartbeat. Its fetid breath washed over me as I skidded to a halt at the edge of a sheer drop. I whirled around, 
the waterfall a deafening cascade behind me. Nowhere to run. The creature stalked forward, its yellow eyes gleaming. A low growl rumbled deep in its chest. This was it. The end of the line. I closed my eyes, a wave of bitter resignation washing over me. The roar of the waterfall filled my ears, mixing with the rasping snarls of the beast. I waited for the crushing blow, the tearing of claws. A scream pierced the air. Not mine. The creature let out a startled snarl, whipping its head around. A blur of movement above us. Carter, standing precariously on a rock ledge halfway down the cliff. He held something in his hands, a flare. Over here, ye ugly bastard, he yelled, his voice shaking. The creature hesitated, its yellow eyes flickering between me and Carter. Then, with a frustrated snarl, it turned and bounded toward the cliff face. Carter, bless his heart, lit the flare and hurled it with all his might. It sailed in a fiery arc, landing in a tangle of bushes near the base of the falls. The creature was instantly fixated on the flames. It let out a low, menacing growl but didn't move any closer. Carter scrambled down the cliff face, his movements clumsy but swift. He reached me, eyes wide with terror. Come on, come on! We retreated slowly, keeping a wary eye on the creature. It stalked back and forth, agitated but wary of the fire. We reached the main trail, then broke into a full-out run, the roar of the falls and the creature's enraged snarls fading as we put distance between us and that unholy clearing. We didn't stop until we reached the ranger station, bursting through the doors covered in sweat, scratches, and fear. The nightmare wasn't over, far from it. We faced evacuations, questions, official reports. The woods around Vernal Falls were closed for months. They never found any sign of the Fullers, or any of the others who disappeared. And they never found the creature. Sometimes I swear I can still feel its eyes on me, hot and hungry. They call it the Skin Stealer now, in whispers around campfires. And on quiet nights, out in the wilderness, I think I sometimes hear its snarl echoing in the darkness. This happened to me a few years ago, back when I was living in Montana. Not the big city life for me, then or now. My name's Carter, and ranching seemed the way to go in that neck of the woods. Hard work, but you're your own boss. Or, well, as close as you can get when nature throws curveballs. The spread wasn't bad. Not huge, but enough to keep me and a few hired hands busy. Mostly cattle, some sheep, the usual Montana mix. Had a double wide out there for myself, plenty of space to spread out when you're not tending the livestock. It started with the sheep, those poor dumb things. I found a few of them ripped to shreds one morning. At first, I figured a wolf pack, maybe, or even a rogue bear. Put out some traps, reinforced the fences, figured that it'd fix it. It didn't. The attacks just shifted. Something was stalking my cattle, something big and strong enough to tear a calf apart, then drag the carcass halfway across the field. Now I've seen some messed up things, but whatever was doing this, it was playing with its food. I called in my brother Ben for help. Never saw the guy scared before, but this got to him. He spent a lot of his younger years in the military, tough as nails, but this time, even Ben was spooked. He swore he saw something huge and dark slink away when he investigated the kill sites. Figured he was either jumpy or swigging too much whiskey to steady his nerves. Chalked it up to an abnormally clever predator. It all came to a head one late summer night. 
Ben and I were drinking beer by the old fire pit, winding down after fixing a broken water pump, when he suddenly froze. I mean, stock still, beer bottle halfway to his mouth. You hear that? He hissed. There was a rustling from the trees. Low growls cut the thick night air. Then we saw it. Standing at the tree lean, just out of the firelight, was the biggest damn wolf-looking thing I'd ever seen. Thing is, it walked on two legs, hunched but towering even at that distance. Eyes yellow and wide, shone like they had their own light source. Get the rifle, Ben choked out. I bolted inside, heart hammering so hard I thought it would burst. Hands shaky, I loaded the hunting rifle, the one Grandpa left me. By the time I was back outside, Ben was gone, his flashlight bobbing wildly in the pitch black towards the woods. I yelled after him, voice hoarse with fear, but he just kept running. Then there was a scream Ben's voice, cut brutally short. That's when my legs decided survival was the better option. I ran back to the house, slammed the door shut, locked every bolt, and hunkered down in the bathroom with the rifle. I must have drifted off, because I was woken by the sound of glass shattering. My blood ran cold. It was in the house. The snarls and thumps outside the bathroom door echoed like gunshots. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't happy about being locked out. It bashed against the wood, again and again, the whole place shaking. Then, blessedly, it stopped. Just as suddenly as it started, there was silence. Silence except for my ragged breathing and the pounding of my heart. I stayed there till dawn. When I finally got the guts to peek out the window, there were tracks too big to be a dog too many toes to be a bear, and they led straight back into those damn trees. There was also a trail of blood. I hoped to God it wasn't Ben's. I packed up and got out of there as soon as the sun hit full strength. Sold the land for dirt cheap. Told folks some story about coyotes being too troublesome, just so they wouldn't think I'd lost my mind. The news reports followed me. Cattle mutilations in Nebraska, sheep slaughtered in Wyoming. Disappearances too, ranch hands, lone hikers. I couldn't shake the feeling those things, whatever they were, were spreading. Ben's body was never found. Didn't know whether that was a blessing or a curse. Sometimes, I swear, when the city lights dim at night, I see those yellow eyes in the shadows. It follows always just beyond the street lamps, just beyond the edge of my sight. The police were no help. No one believed a word I said about that night, but I haven't slept a whole night through since. I'm thinking Alaska next. Maybe somewhere so cold, so desolate, that even that creature will think twice about following. This happened to me a few years back. I'm still trying to understand it, still struggling to make sense of what I saw. See, I'm a hiker, the kind that craves long expeditions on remote trails. That should tell you something about me. I don't scare easily. I've dealt with wildlife, gotten myself lost, handled it all. But this, this was entirely different. It began in Sequoia National Park. You've probably heard of it, that place with the giant trees. I had a permit for an extended backcountry trek. The route was barely used, snaking along ridges and through ravines deep in the southern part of the park. I craved the isolation. Maybe that's what makes me a fool in hindsight. It was supposed to be ten days, and I felt the usual thrill that first morning— the pack on my back, the wilderness waiting. The first few days went smooth as silk. Weather was perfect, scenery beyond belief. It was quiet, so quiet you could hear a pin drop, 
or so I thought. That fourth night is when things shifted. I heard it, at first too subtle to pinpoint. A rustle, a heavy footstep, something out there in the vast darkness. I dismissed it, must have been a deer or a bear. I secured my food, stoked the fire, and tried to sleep. But the sounds kept coming. The following morning I found tracks, and they weren't from anything I could identify. Too large for a bear or mountain lion, vaguely human but misshapen. A chill went down my spine. Someone else was out there, but whoever it was didn't want to be seen, and something told me they weren't exactly friendly. I made the decision to cut my trip short. The smart thing, right? Get out while I still had a chance. Stupid pride, that's what decided otherwise. I pushed on, but my pace quickened. I started seeing things in the shadows, hearing whispers in the trees. My mind was playing tricks, pure and simple. I knew it. Only, I didn't entirely believe it. By the sixth day, I was on edge and exhausted. It felt like eyes were on me at all times. Then came the worst part, the smell. Like rotting meat and something musky I couldn't place. That's when I knew I wasn't alone. And worse, I knew it wasn't human. I ran. Blindly. I must have covered miles without realizing it. That evening, I chanced upon a ranger cabin tucked into the woods, abandoned for the season. My heart leapt. Shelter may be a phone. I burst through the door and slammed it shut behind me. There was silence. A single room, musty, untouched. My relief was short-lived. Outside the window, something huge moved slowly past. My blood ran cold. It wasn't just the creature's size, though it stood a good seven feet tall at the shoulder, moving hunched. It was the unnaturalness of it fur, matted and dark, limbs long and impossibly bent, a muzzle too wide for anything I'd ever known. It had eyes, though. They locked onto mine for a long moment, glowing amber in the dusk. Then it vanished into the trees. That night was a blur. Barricading the door was pointless. I knew that. The walls felt flimsy. Sleep was impossible. Every creak, every snap of a twig, was it coming closer? Morning came at last, and my one thought was escape. I didn't care about gear or supplies anymore. I broke through the tree lean and ran. It was behind me. I could feel it. Not a proper chase, just biding its time. The trees thinned out. A meadow lay ahead, a road beyond it. Salvation. I was halfway across the clearing when I heard it, the scream. A woman's voice, cut off abruptly. It came from the same woods I'd fled. I froze. Something exploded from the tree line, and the woman ran into view, two hikers a step behind her. All three looked terrified, shouting incoherently. It was then I saw it properly. The creature loped on all fours gaining on them at an impossible speed. Its face was locked in a grotesque grin, fangs bared. I didn't think. I just ran back toward the tree lean, yelled as loud as I could. The creature hesitated, swiveling its head, those damnable eyes finding me once again. The hikers got their head start. They vanished into the woods, screaming. I never saw any of them again. The creature watched for a long moment, then turned back to the woods. After an eternity, it disappeared amongst the trees. I stumbled out of the woods the following day, half delirious. Told the park rangers some story about a wild animal. They didn't believe me, of course. Nobody would. Years have gone by, and I still see its face the twisted blend of dog and something far more sinister. Sometimes, I almost think I imagined it all. 
But then I remember the smell, the screams, and the knowledge that there are things out there far older and darker than we understand. This happened to me a few years back, on a trip to the Smoky Mountains. I'm Eamon, retired now, but I used to work as a surveyor, way out in the back country. It was good, honest work, even if a bit lonely sometimes. Figured spending time in nature was better than rotting in a cubicle. But after what I saw, well, I put in my two weeks' notice the moment I got back to civilization. We were up on a ridge mapping a new section of trail. Thick trees, the kind of place where a man could disappear and never be found. My partner, Ben, was a seasoned outdoorsman, knew those woods like his own backyard. Me, I was still finding my footing, sometimes literally. It was near sundown when I stumbled into the clearing. Not much of one, just a patch of dirt ringed by old half-dead trees. Something was off about that place. No birdsong, no rustle of squirrels, just a heavy, oppressive silence. And there in the center of the clearing, it was a carcass, stripped down to the bone. Dear, at first I thought, but something was wrong with the skull. Too long, too many teeth. Then I heard Ben yell from further down the ridge. Amen! Get your tail over here. Something's wrong. I ran, my breath catching in my throat. Found him up a gnarled oak tree, his face white as ash. He pointed down into the ravine below. At first, I couldn't make it out with the evening light fading, but then the creature moved. It stood on two legs like a man, easily seven feet tall. Its body was lean, sinewy covered in matted black fur. The head, that was what stuck with me, a wolf's muzzle stretched long, its mouth lined with needle-sharp teeth. And those eyes glowed yellow in the half-light, filled with a chilling intelligence. Not an animal, not fully. Something else. Dogman, Ben whispered, his voice hoarse. Thought they was just stories. It lifted its head then, scenting the air, and I knew it had caught our smell. We were dead men if we stayed there. Ben didn't even try to climb down the way we came, just dropped out of the tree and ran for it. I followed, my legs pumping on pure instinct. Branches whipped my face, but I didn't feel the pain, just the hot breath of that thing on the back of my neck. We burst out of the trees onto the gravel road where our truck was parked. Didn't stop running until we saw the headlights. Ben slammed on the brakes, swerved off the road, throwing up gravel. I piled into the passenger seat, and he floored it. I looked back, half expecting to see that creature loping after us, but there was nothing but the shadows of the trees. Ben drove straight to the nearest town, some tiny place with a single bar and a flickering gas station. Burst in there, white-faced and babbling about monsters in the woods. The locals looked at us like we'd sprouted horns, mix of amusement and pity. Seemed they heard it all before, drunk ramblings and tall tales. Except for the old guy in the corner booth. He didn't laugh. Just nodded, slow and deliberate. Said there's things in the mountains, things older than the first settlers. Best to leave them be, to not go looking where you ain't meant to. The next morning, we drove out of there fast as we could. Ben dropped me off back in the city without a word, like he was afraid whatever I'd seen was contagious. After that, I couldn't go back to the woods, not when every snap of a twig made me jump and every rustle of leaves sounded like claws on bark. Ben, he kept working outdoors said confronting your demons was the only way to chase them off. Last I heard, he'd headed up to Alaska, looking for a surveying gig out on the tundra. Stubborn fool. 
I heard a few months later about a hiker that went missing in those parts. Body was never found, just tracks that didn't add up. Sometimes, late at night, I dream I'm back in that clearing. The silence hangs in the air, the carcass lies picked clean, and then the creature steps out of the shadows. Its eyes gleam in the darkness, and I know it's found me again. My name's Mason Reed and this happened to me back in 2008. Ex-Army, recruited into one of those off-the-books divisions of the CIA that nobody likes to talk about. My wife thought I worked in logistics. Safer that way for everyone. This particular nightmare unfolded in the Alaskan wilderness. We'd been tracking an increase in disappearances, way too high even for a place as unforgiving as Alaska. Hikers, hunters, even a team of geologists, vanished without a trace. Locals blamed weather, grizzlies, the usual. But the higher-ups suspected something, more. I was sent in undercover, posing as a wildlife photographer. Set up camp in a remote valley, miles from civilization. Alaska in winter, it has a way of getting into your head. The silence isn't empty, it's alive, pressing down on you. And the nights, the darkness is so pure, you feel like you could fall into it and never touch bottom. The first week was uneventful, almost boring. Then came the blizzard. Wind howled like a wounded animal. My tent was barely holding on. It was almost a relief when the radio crackled, a distress call from another team in the area. They'd found something, something they couldn't explain. Before the storm cut the signal, they gave me their coordinates. I considered waiting it out. I'm not ashamed to admit the rational part of me was screaming to stay put. But duty's a hell of a thing, and those people out there, there was a chance I could help. I geared up, loaded my rifle, and set out into the whirling snow. It took hours to reach their coordinates. It felt like walking through a white void. The storm had reshaped the terrain, burying landmarks. When I finally stumbled upon their camp, it was a scene of carnage. Tents ripped to shreds, gear scattered, and blood smeared across the snow. Not bare attack, this was deliberate, methodical. That's when I saw the tracks. I've hunted everything from deer to insurgents, and I'd never seen anything like them. Large, three-toed, the claw marks sunk deep. Following the trail led me upslope, into the heart of the blizzard. Then I saw it, a hulking silhouette moving against the blinding white. It was tall, at least seven feet, its frame hunched and emaciated looking. For clung to its patchy skin, revealing glimpses of bone and sinew. The head was, it looked almost canine, but elongated into a muzzle that seemed too long, too full of teeth. It turned towards me, and I'll never forget those eyes. They glowed yellow in the storm, filled not with animal instinct but a chilling intelligence. In that moment, I understood this wasn't just a predator. This was something calculating— something that saw me as the prey. It lunged. I barely had time to raise my rifle and fire. The shots hit, I swear they did, but the thing didn't even flinch. It shrieked, a piercing sound that cut through the storm, and launched itself at me with impossible speed. I scrambled back, lost my footing and tumbled down the slope, my rifle flying from my grasp. I saw it looming above me, that skeletal form silhouetted against the swirling snow, its claws outstretched. I closed my eyes, expecting the killing blow. Then a gunshot echoed, not from my rifle. The creature screamed in fury. I opened my eyes in time to see a figure charging through the blizzard, firing wildly at the beast. Another operative, 
just in the nick of time. Together, we drove it back, the storm providing enough cover for it to disappear into the wilderness. We regrouped back at what was left of my camp, the snow beginning to let up. My backup, Novak his name was, helped me patch up the worst of the gashes on my arm from when I fell. While we worked, I saw the grim set of his jaw, the tension in his shoulders. You ever see something like that? I asked. He didn't look at me, just shook his head. The reports, the things they tell us back in Langley. Novak paused, searching for the right words. Sometimes it's better not to know. Better to write it off as bears, bad luck, the stories crazy locals tell. We filed our reports, of course. Played down the encounter. The agency doesn't like loose ends, unexplained phenomena. They sent in a cleanup crew, buried the whole incident. Me? They offered a transfer, a desk job somewhere warm. I turned them down. I'm still out there bouncing from one frozen wasteland to the next. Can't say I blame those old-timers who whisper about things man wasn't meant to see. Sometimes, ignorance is truly bliss, and out there in the wild places, that ignorance is getting harder and harder to find. My name's Alex Tanner, and the mess I'm about to tell you about happened back in August of 2014. I'm a field operative for the CIA, the kind of guy sent in when things go sideways. The weirder the circumstances, the better suited I am for the job. I've been a lot of places, seen a lot of things, but nothing prepared me for the Adirondack Mountains. I'd like to tell my wife these stories someday. Maybe when she thinks I've finally gone soft, tell her all about the shadows that lurk in the American wilderness. For now, it's just another mission coded, encrypted, the truth buried under layers of red tape. We were tracking some chatter about a rogue paramilitary group experimenting with genetic modification, supposedly messing around with animal DNA to create something off the books. My team was two other seasoned CIA agents, Novak and Ramirez, and a biologist, Dr. Walsh. We always brought a specialist along for jobs like these. Novak was ex-army rangers, built like a bear with nerves of steel. Ramirez, our tech specialist, was always cracking terrible jokes to lighten the mood. Dr. Walsh, though brilliant, was maybe the least outdoors a person you could imagine. Didn't stop her from complaining about how primitive our camp setup was. The Adirondacks are beautiful, but in an untamed, primal sort of way, thick with ancient forest and crisscrossed by old logging trails. We were deep in, miles from the nearest sign of civilization. The local rumors were pretty outlandish something huge, with glowing eyes, attacking hikers and vanishing without a trace. I figured it was probably a bear, maybe infected with rabies, but orders were orders. We spent two weeks hunting for any sign of the supposed facility. Nights were chilly, the ground hard, and our packs were getting lighter. Morale was slipping, and even I was starting to think this was a wild goose chase. Then came the fourth night. I woke to a sound like someone dragging a wet sack of meat across the forest floor. I nudged Novak awake, and we listened in the pitch-black silence. Then we heard it again, a deep, scraping, snuffling sound that sent shivers down my spine. We woke Ramirez and Dr. Walsh, trying to stay quiet, but it didn't matter. The thing knew we were there. I flipped on my night vision— the world outside our tents was washed in shades of eerie green. Novak whispered for Dr. Walsh to stay close. The clearing was dead silent, except for our own ragged breathing. And then it charged. The creature burst from the shadows, 
an unholy fusion of animal and nightmare. It was massive, twice the size of any bear, moving with unnatural speed and ferocity. Its eyes gleamed in the night vision like hot coals. It was all muscle and teeth, a patchwork chimera of coarse fur, ragged claws, and raw, pulsing sinew. The stench of it, rotting meat and something sulfurous, made me gag. We opened fire, the gunshots cracking through the night, but the creature barely flinched. It slammed into Novak, sending him sprawling, his gun flying from his hand. Novak screamed as the creature raked its claws across his back, tearing his pack open like it weighed nothing. Ramirez grabbed Dr. Walsh and bolted into the woods. Through the chaos, I caught a glimpse of the doctor fumbling with her pack, pulling out a syringe. It's a sedative, she yelled over the beast's screeches. Just distract it. I fired another volley into the creature, more to buy them time than inflict any real harm. It roared and spun, giving chase to Ramirez and Dr. Walsh. I took the chance, sprinting across the clearing towards Novak, who was slumped against a tree. As I reached Novak, I realized there was a gaping wound across his back, his blood seeping into the moss. I tried to stop the bleeding as best I could, but he kept choking, gasping out ragged breaths. Then his eyes rolled back into his head, and he was gone. The creature was gaining, closing the distance with disturbing speed. Ramirez tossed a flare behind it, a burst of bright red light in the sea of night vision green. The creature paused, confused, and Dr. Walsh seized the moment. She ran in with surprising agility, burying the syringe in the monster's thick hide. The effect was almost immediate. It faltered, let out a shuddering, strangled cry, then lumbered a few more steps before collapsing into the undergrowth. I turned back to Novak with a flicker of hope. Maybe he was just unconscious, maybe there was still time, but a glance at his still form confirmed the gut-wrenching truth. The light was gone from his eyes. Rage surged through me, a blinding, white-hot fury that banished the cold tendrils of terror. I didn't stop to think, just sprinted over towards Ramirez and Dr. Walsh. They were standing over the downed creature, Dr. Walsh scribbling furiously into a notebook with the single-minded intensity of a scientist confronted with the unimaginable. Ramirez saw me coming and shook his head. He's gone, man, he said, his voice thick with grief and a tremor I couldn't blame him for. That thing, it ripped him open. I wanted to scream, to lash out at the monster, at the damned woods, at the whole cruel, senseless situation. Instead, I stood rigid, my hands clenched into fists at my sides, my breasts harsh and ragged in the night. Can you, can you make contact with base? I asked, forcing a semblance of control into my voice. We need backup, a chopper. Ramirez shook his head again, looking grim. Tried the second it went down. Calms are scrambled, no signal. We're on our own out here. That single sentence was the nail in the coffin for any shred of normalcy. We were isolated, cut off and at the mercy of whatever that thing was. And there was Dr. Walsh, oblivious to the danger we were still in, practically drooling over the creature like it was a prized specimen. What the hell are you doing? I snarled at her, snatching the notebook from her grasp. She blinked in surprise, then her jaw set in a stubborn line. Documenting. This is a groundbreaking discovery. Think of the possibilities, possibilities. Lady, we just lost a teammate. That thing out there is a goddamn killing machine. She scoffed, then gestured dismissively towards the creature's prone form. Clearly it's vulnerable. The sedative worked. It was madness. This woman, 
She was so wrapped up in her work she couldn't see the forest for the trees, or the blood dripping from the claws of the monster she was so keen to study. But without backup, we needed her. And maybe, I hated to admit, with the creature still sedated, she did have a point. Fine, I gritted out. But we're doing this my way. Prioritize our safety and getting the hell out of here. Dr. Walsh, though clearly disgruntled, didn't argue further. We took tissue samples and whatever data we could gather from the creature quickly and efficiently. I kept glancing back into the dark woods, the hair on the back of my neck prickling constantly. Even sedated, the thing radiated menace. By the time the first rays of dawn painted the sky gray, we'd done what we could. I used the satellite phone to send a coded distress signal, knowing it was a long shot, but hoping the distortion wouldn't render it completely useless. Now what? Ramirez asked, voicing the question hanging heavy in the air between us. Do we wait for it to wake up, or... No, I said, my mind already working. We couldn't stay, but we also couldn't leave that thing alive. We set a trap. Use the rest of the sedative, lure it to the clearing, and torch the whole damn forest if we have to. We worked fast. Dr. Walsh, with some coaxing, concocted a potent cocktail using high-proof liquor from our supplies and the remaining sedative. We baited the clearing the smell of alcohol sharp and strange in the crisp morning air. Then we rigged the place with tripwires and incendiaries. All the while, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were digging our own graves. By the time we were done, the sun was higher in the sky. The creature still hadn't stirred. But it would. And when it did, the ensuing fight would be a desperate bid for survival with slim odds stacked against us. We waited, hunkered down out of sight, the tension a razor wire strung between us. It felt like forever, but it was only hours before the first twig snapped in the distance. I exchanged grim glances with Ramirez and Dr. Walsh, our weapons raised. I made a mental note it had been Walsh who named this clearing ground zero, it felt morbidly appropriate now. The creature appeared at the edge of the clearing, moving tentatively at first. It sniffed the air, a low growl rumbling in its chest. Then, its burning yellow eyes fixed on the bait, and it lunged with terrifying speed. The makeshift trap worked perfectly. As the creature hit the tripwire, the incendiaries triggered, showering the clearing in flames. The heat was instant, the roar of the fire deafening. The creature thrashed and bellowed, a monstrous silhouette contorted in agony against the inferno we'd created. I didn't look away. Witnessing the demise of this bioengineered abomination was the only form of closure I could hope for out here. Novak deserved that much. Hours later, the flames died down, leaving the clearing a charred wasteland. Of the creature, only ash and blackened bone remained. Ramirez and I collected what was left, securing it for transport, doing our best to follow protocol for what, we all knew, was fundamentally beyond protocol. Rescue arrived a day later, drawn feebly to our coded distress signal. They swarmed the site, the suits and clean-up crew a stark contrast to the horror we'd endured. I stood by stoically as Dr. Walsh was pulled aside for questioning, knowing they'd get no clear answers about what really happened out there. My report would be classified, sanitized. Novak's death became another sad statistic buried within Langley's walls. The aftermath is a blur. Debriefings, evaluations, the same damn questions twisted and rephrased until they were meaningless. They poked and prodded, searching for cracks in my psyche. I kept my mouth shut about the true nature of the thing we'd faced, following the unspoken rules of the game. 
Better a hero with a touch of shell shock than a lunatic ranting about monsters made in a lab. They sent me home on leave, said to take some time. But home isn't a haven anymore. At night, the Adirondacks invade my dreams, the ancient trees, the glowing eyes in the dark, and the ever-present echo of Novak's final scream. Some wounds never truly heal. And there's always that prickling dread. Maybe they didn't get everything out of those woods. Maybe there were more experiments, more creatures made and let loose in the world, waiting for a hiker, a camper, a team of unsuspecting CIA agents to cross their path. My name is Alex Shepard, and this happened to me on October 6, 1991. Back then, I was green, fresh out of Quantico, and assigned to one of the CIA's more specialized divisions. The kind that handles the kind of stuff that'd get you laughed out of most FBI offices. I just started dating this girl, Sarah a nurse with a heart of gold and a laugh that could disarm a nuclear bomb. Thinking back, I guess, is why I still remember the exact date. It's burned into my memory now. My latest assignment was a doozy, even by my standards. Turns out, a small town in the Smoky Mountains had a problem. A rash of unexplained disappearances. Livestock slaughtered with chilling efficiency. The locals spun wild yarns of half-seen figures lurking just beyond the campfire light, whispered about hauntings and skinwalkers. I figured it was meth addicts or some serial killer with a flair for the dramatic, but my superiors saw an opportunity, a chance to field-test our theories about other potential threats lurking in the shadows. The town of Ashwood, Tennessee, was the epitome of small-town America, a main street lined with quaint storefronts, a white steepled church, and an air of quiet watchfulness that set my teeth on edge. I set up a makeshift base in a room above the general store, with my equipment spread across the creaky wooden floors. The first few days were spent interviewing locals and hiking the dense trails that snaked through the surrounding hills. Standard Procedure I listened to tales passed down through generations, sifted through the paranoia for any kernel of truth. There was a pattern, that much was clear. Victims vanished at night, near the tree lean, with zero evidence left behind. Whatever was out there was efficient, meticulous, unnatural. That third night in Ashwood, I decided it was time to go from observer to hunter. Armed with a rifle, night vision goggles, and a healthy dose of skepticism, I staked out a spot near the site of the most recent disappearance. It was well past midnight, the forest bathed in an eerie, silvery glow, when I heard it. A rustle in the underbrush, then a low snarl that cut through the silence like a knife. Adrenaline surged through my veins. Whatever made that sound, it wasn't human. With painstaking slowness, I turned, night vision goggles amplifying the gloom. And that's when I saw it. Crouched in the shadows, not ten feet from me, was a creature straight out of nightmares. It was impossibly large, sleek as a panther but twice the size, with coarse, mangy fur. But it was the eyes that chilled my blood, two burning coals of yellow light, reflecting back the pale moonlight. And as realization dawned, that was when it moved. The creature was a blur, impossibly fast for its size. I barely had time to raise my rifle before it was upon me, a whirlwind of claws and teeth. I fired, more out of instinct than aim, and the night erupted in a cacophony of noise, the creature letting out a hiss of pain. But it wasn't enough. It knocked the rifle from my hands its claws raking across my arm, a burst of white-hot pain. Desperation fueled me. I fumbled for the pistol strapped to my leg, but the creature was back, 
lunging for my throat. I twisted, throwing myself backwards just in time as its teeth snapped shut on empty air. I rolled, scrambled to my feet, the creature circling me with calculated alertness. A flicker of movement caught my eye, my rifle, lying several feet away. I made a mad dash for it, all my survival instincts screaming in protest. Reaching the rifle felt like a lifetime. Each second I expected to feel the searing pain of claws sinking into my flesh. I fumbled with the weapon, hearing the creature snarl behind me. I turned, raising the rifle in one desperate motion. It was just in time. The creature lunged, a monstrous shadow hurtling towards me. I squeezed the trigger once, twice, three times. The impact of the bullets threw it back and it let out a guttural roar that echoed through the forest. In the dim light, I could see dark patches bloom on its fur. Blood. It was wounded, but far from dead. Instinctively, I knew this was my chance. Ignoring the fiery pain in my arm, I bolted back towards the town. The creature hesitated for a moment, then lunged after me, its snarls growing in intensity with each step. I ran like hell, my lungs burning, the sound of its pursuit drumming in my ears. Ahead I saw the first flickering lights of Ashwood. My shouts ripped through the night. The creature, perhaps sensing an ambush, broke off its pursuit at the edge of the forest, dissolving back into the shadows. But I could see its eyes, those gleaming yellow orbs, following me all the way back to safety. The aftermath was a mess of cover-ups, hush money, and official reports filed under unsolved animal attacks. My injuries healed, slowly, leaving behind scars both physical and mental. I broke up with Sarah couldn't explain the nightmares, the sudden bursts of paranoia, even to myself. I'm still with the agency, still hunting things that go bump in the night. They ship me from one godforsaken corner of the country to another, wherever a whisper of something monstrous sends ripples through the rural heartland. I've tracked creatures beyond count, each one more disturbing than the last, but none have haunted me like the beast in the Smoky Mountains. Because with each new assignment, with each chilling encounter, the question burns in my gut, was it the same creature? Did I simply wound and displace it, driving it to other hunting grounds? Or are there more of its kind out there, lurking and unseen? This happened to me in the fall of 2010. Lived in a tiny A-frame cabin up in the Smoky Mountains then just outside Bryson City. Moved there to escape the rat race. Figured, if a man can't find peace in those woods, he ain't gonna find it anywhere. My name's Henry, by the way. Autumn's hunting season up that way, so I was used to hearing rifle shots ring out in the distance. But this late afternoon, the sound was different. Closer. And it wasn't one shot, but bam 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 like a whole magazine emptied in a hurry. Came from down near the creek, maybe a half mile from my cabin. I figured someone stumbled across a big buck, maybe a bear even. But then I heard yelling. Not the excited whoop of a hunter, but a raw, terrified scream. It cut off abruptly with a wet, choking sound that chilled me to the bone. Now I'm not a hero. Never claimed to be but something felt wrong, unnatural. I couldn't just stay inside, knowing there might be someone in trouble a short hike away. Grabbed my old shotgun, same one my granddaddy taught me to shoot with back when I was a kid, and headed out towards the sound. The woods were already going dark, sunlight filtering through the trees in long, orange streaks. Every snap twig, every rustle of leaves made me jump. I found the source of the commotion by the creek. It wasn't no hunting accident. 
There was a man lying face down in the shallow water. Blood spread around him like spilled paint. Clothes were torn. The back of his neck looked like it had been chewed on. I recognized him. Young guy named Tanner worked at the gas station in town. I was kneeling next to him, checking for a pulse I knew I wouldn't find, when something snagged my attention, a flicker of movement in the trees on the far side of the creek. I looked up, the shotgun aimed but my hands shaking. That's when I got my first clear look at it. Maybe eight feet tall, stood hunched in the shadows. Covered in slick, dark fur that clung tight to skin like raw muscle. It looked wrong, somehow, too long, too many joints. And the head. God, the head. Small and bald, the mouth split in a wicked grin full of jagged fangs. Eyes like hot coals in the twilight. This thing wasn't natural, wasn't normal. It was pure nightmare. Panic took over. I squeezed the trigger. The shotgun boomed. The recoil nearly knocked me on my ass. Buckshot peppered the trees across the water, but the creature was gone, vanished like a wraith. I didn't see where it went. Didn't want to. I stumbled back from the creek, not even bothering to reload, and ran blind towards my cabin. I could hear it crashing through the undergrowth behind me, its snarls echoing through those ancient trees. I made it back just as night truly fell. Slammed the door, bolted it, then leaned against the wall, gasping as sweat ran down my face. I thought for sure it would try to break in, smash through the windows. But all I heard was silence. After a while, I worked up the nerve to peek out. Nothing. Next morning I went back to the creek with two deputies from town. Found some bloodstains in the woods, some torn-up bushes, but no sign of the creature or what was left of Tanner. Deputies looked at me like I'd lost my marbles, mumbled something about wild hogs, but I saw the doubt in their eyes. They knew that wasn't the work of any animal they recognized. I don't live in that cabin anymore. Sold it after a few sleepless weeks, moved down closer to town, took a job as a night watchman at a warehouse. It ain't much of a life, but at least I see people, lights, civilization. Still got nightmares, of course. Still wake up in a cold sweat, convinced I hear the rustling of leaves outside my window. See, the thing is, I know somewhere out there in those deep, dark mountain woods, the creature is still lurking. Still hungry. And sometimes, on those lonely nights at the warehouse, I look out at the inky blackness beyond the fence and wonder, is it looking back at me, too? This happened to me in the fall of 2006. My name's Travis Jensen and I live way out in the Gila National Forest in New Mexico. It's a lonely, beautiful place, thousands of acres of pines, canyons, and silence. I work for the Forest Service, keeping an eye on things, running trail maintenance, and reporting anything out of the ordinary. Mostly it's uneventful, which suits me just fine. A couple of weeks back, things started to get strange around my place. I live in a rustic cabin, way off the beaten path. One morning, coming back from a supply run in Silver City, I found my door busted open and the place trashed. It didn't look like a robbery. Stuff was broken, food scattered, but nothing seemed missing. Just random violence. I found myself on edge, but I chalked it up to a rogue bear or some kids messing around. I patched the door and got on with my life. A few days later, coming home at dusk, I found an elk carcass near my porch. It was fresh, but half-eaten and torn apart. Now, there are predators in these woods, 
but nothing leaves a kill for the scavengers like this. I started sleeping with my shotgun by the bed and got extra careful while patrolling my section of forest. Still, it felt like someone, or something, was watching me. Yesterday it got worse. I was out marking some downed trees near my cabin. It was hot, quiet work. Suddenly, I caught a flash of motion out of the corner of my eye. Something big, moving through the trees. I dropped my chainsaw and picked up my shotgun. I shouted, Who's there? No answer, just the dam whined through the leaves. I scanned the forest, heart pounding like a drum. The woods felt different, menacing all of a sudden, even though it was the same place I'd known for years. Then I saw them, two eyes reflecting the sunlight through the trees. They were low to the ground, about six feet up if I had to guess. Not a bear. Too tall for a mountain lion. I moved closer, raising the gun. The creature moved, revealing itself for just a moment. It seemed massive, covered in thick, dark fur, with hunched shoulders. Its limbs were long and muscular, ending in enormous claws. I could make out a powerful, sinewy tail. That one glimpse was enough. It was no animal I had ever seen described in the park literature. Terror punched the air from my lungs. I fired a shot, more to scare the thing than anything else. The creature let out a roar, unlike anything I've ever heard, and bolted away, crashing through the underbrush. The rest of the day passed in a blur. I went back to my cabin, barricaded myself in, shotgun loaded and at the ready. I didn't even try to get any sleep. That brings us to today. I haven't dared leave my cabin. It's been quiet, almost unnervingly so. I keep peering out the window, flinching with every noise. I checked my phone, no cell service at this altitude. I'm alone out here. I'll probably have to make a run for it at some point, head down to Silver City and get help. But something keeps me frozen in place. I keep thinking of the carcass, torn apart, and those strange eyes in the trees. That night, under the cover of darkness, I heard noises around the cabin. Scratching, scraping, and low, guttural growls that shook the old walls. Something was out there, biding its time. I called the ranger station, but the line was dead. The last thing I saw as I looked through the window, right before writing this, was the outline of a massive shape moving past the sliver of moonlight cutting through the boarded-up windows. My shotgun is loaded, my hands are shaking. If anything tries to break in. The night stretched on, an eternity of terror and strange silence. I didn't dare turn off the meager lamp, its orange glow the only comfort against the smothering darkness. My fingers ached from gripping my shotgun, my eyes constantly flicking between the windows. Each rasping breath echoing in the silence brought fresh dread. Had it found another way in? Were those claws scraping the roof? Would the boards of my door hold? Suddenly, a sickening thump against the wall nearly sent me through the roof. I fired blindly through the window, the roar of the gun temporarily deafening me. Outside, there was an unearthly scream, followed by silence. For a moment, I dared to hope whatever it was had been wounded and scared off. But that hope was quickly squashed. Something started to tear at the cabin, shaking the entire structure. With every rip of wood, a new wave of fear crashed over me. The flimsy barricades wouldn't hold much longer. I had to move. Grabbing my bag with spare ammo, a flashlight, and my pocket knife, I made a mad dash for my truck. Every instinct yelled at me to run into the woods, to disappear under the cover of the night. But that was just as certain a death sentence. My only hope was a desperate drive to town. 
The door to the truck ripped open with surprising ease, the locks no match for those tremendous claws. With shaking hands I fumbled for the keys, the scream outside growing closer. I turned the ignition, willing the old engine to start. It sputtered and coughed, then roared to life. Slamming it into gear, I tore away from the cabin, the headlights cutting a swath through the darkness. That's when I saw it, fully illuminated. A hulking monstrosity, its dark fur slick with blood. Its impossibly clawed hands swiped at my fleeing truck, its teeth bared in a feral grimace. The thing was fast, unbelievably fast. It bounded alongside the truck, its yellow eyes burning into mine through the window. Its roars rattled the windows, shattering one. A burst of speed, a well-aimed shot, and I thought I might have lost it. The forest blurred as I careened along the dirt roads, dodging fallen logs and rocks. Just when I thought I was in the clear, that familiar, blood-curdling roar split the night. I glanced in the rearview mirror. It was on my truck. The creature clung to the tailgate, its weight dragging down the back. Frantically, I steered to buck it off, nearly swerving off the road myself. I slammed on the brakes. The creature, taken by surprise, was sent sprawling across the ground. Its eyes gleamed with rage as it lunged for the truck once more. I reversed, then gunned the engine. Tires screeched against the dirt, metal crumpled, and I heard the satisfying crunch as the truck barreled over its form. It howled in pain, then lay still. I didn't look back until I reached the outskirts of Silver City. The police didn't believe me. The ranger station did, especially after finding the wreckage of my cabin. No wildlife officials could ever identify the creature, and none have been reported since. They chalked it up to animal attack, maybe a black bear with mange acting strangely. Whatever the truth was, it was written off. I never went back to my job in the forest. I don't live in New Mexico anymore, for that matter. Cities suit me fine now, places where I'm always surrounded by people and noise. The memory of those yellow eyes still flickers in my nightmares sometimes, and a rustle of leaves in a quiet room can still make me jump. I'll never look at the woods the same way again. This happened to me a decade ago when I was invited by my friend, Frederick Hackman, to enjoy a weekend getaway at his family's cabin. We were accompanied by a few more friends, Alice Hartfield, Ray Valento, and Lottie Tripper. We had been planning the trip for some time, so naturally we were excited. Our destination was a small cabin Frederick's family owned deep within the dense Appalachian Mountains. The environment was serene, with lush greenery surrounding us. Little did we know that this would take a terrifying turn. When we arrived at the cabin, it seemed like the epitome of peace and tranquility. We unpacked our belongings and settled in quickly. As evening approached, Frederick shared an interesting tidbit about his family's adventures here when they were younger. We laughed and shared some stories of our own. Feeling refreshed, we went for a hike the following morning, tracing our steps carefully. During our venture, Lottie discovered a peculiar tree with deep gashes on its trunk. It looked as if something sharp had repeatedly slashed the bark. Shrugging it off as the work of hunters or animals scratching their backs, we continued onward without further investigation. As we trekked deeper into the woods, Ray felt an uneasy sensation creeping upon him. He hesitated for a moment before mustering the courage to share his discomfort with us perhaps we were being watched by someone or something in the woods. Alice laughed it off dismissively, and jokingly accused Ray of being afraid of his own shadow. 
Her words momentarily lifted everyone's spirits and quelled Ray's concerns. However, on our return to the cabin that evening, something far more shocking awaited us. The front door was wide open. It seemed forced ajar with great strength. Our belongings were scattered carelessly around the floor while odd markings tarnished the walls. Panic swept over us and nobody could fathom a logical explanation. Given how isolated we were, there was no means to call for help. The nearest ranger station was hours away, so we decided to arm ourselves and wait till morning. That night, unable to sleep, I kept watch over everyone from my window. An uneasy drizzle began to fall when I noticed a silhouette lurking in the darkness. It appeared to be a large man carrying an axe. But not just any ordinary axe. It had a nasty, serrated edge that screamed malevolence. Afraid of causing further panic, I made a deliberate decision not to inform my friends about this ominous figure. I felt helpless as I gazed upon this harrowing sight, wondering what he or they wanted with us. As dawn approached, the tall figure retreated into the dense forest. With little time left before sunrise and our friends still asleep, I convinced Ray initially to accompany me while investigating the area outside where the menacing figure had previously stood. With Frederick's hunting rifle in my hands and Ray cautiously following with a baseball bat, we stepped cautiously onto the damp grounds. The earth seemed violated by fresh bootprints that led deeper into the forest where we dared not venture any further. We returned to the cabin, informing Frederick and Alice of our discoveries. However, Lottie had vanished without a trace during our absence. Distraught by her disappearance, and afraid that something terrible awaited us in those woods, we made haste and prepared to leave. With each passing minute, our anxiety mounted as we found ourselves lost deeper within the dense wilderness encompassing us. Desperately seeking an escape route while trying to remain vigilant of any potential danger lurking nearby. In the distance, I saw a glimmer of light and hoped it was our escape route. We stumbled upon an old, yet seemingly operational truck parked on a narrow path, hidden by overgrown branches. Frederick, being knowledgeable about vehicles, managed to hotwire it while the rest of us kept watch. Soon, the engine roared to life. With its headlights piercing through the darkness, we drove along the winding path without facing any obstacles. But just as we thought maybe fortune finally favored us, we were startled by the sudden appearance of these monstrous figures on the road. These men had grotesque features like those out of a horror movie, disfigured faces, twisted limbs, and yellowish teeth sharpened to a point. And with every step they took toward us, I could sense a repugnant odor that strengthened my resolve to not let them anywhere near us. Frederick floored the gas pedal as soon as he realized these cannibalistic mountain men were chasing us. They also seemed capable of unimaginable speeds as they managed to keep up with our vehicle. It became an adrenaline-filled race against time with our lives at stake. Panicking Alice asked why we didn't call for help earlier. The truth was that due to our location deep within the forest, we lacked any form of communication, leaving us at the mercy of these cruel predators. While speeding through the rocky trails, Ray spotted an upcoming cliff and yelled for Frederick to hit the brakes right before we reached it. He did so in the nick of time as we skidded to a halt at the edge. Not expecting this sudden change in momentum, our monstrous pursuers advanced uncontrolled toward the cliff. Their momentum sent some charging over its edge and plummeting into the abyss below, buying us valuable time to act. Quickly forming a plan, Ray proposed attempting to climb down while securing ourselves with ropes found in the truck. We had no other choice. It was a gamble we needed to take. While Frederick and Alice kept watch for any remaining hunters, Ray and I carried out our plan. 
Descending the steep cliffside wasn't an easy task, but we managed to reach the bottom safely, knowing that our survival rested upon this success. We trekked on for what felt like hours through unfamiliar territory. As we stumbled out of the forest, fatigued yet grateful, we found a small village where we could seek help. The villagers listened to our story with shock and empathy while offering the comforts of food and shelter. It turned out that these cannibalistic mountain men had been terrorizing hikers and travelers passing through the area for years. The villagers advised us to depart once recovered and never return. In honor of Lottie, whose fate sadly remained uncertain, we vowed to share our encounter with others, urging them to avoid the area where malevolence thrived undisturbed. The event left us forever haunted by not only this grisly horror, but also the understanding that evil sometimes lurked beyond our wildest imagination. We silently hoped that no one else would have to face the same nightmare as we did in those wilderness depths. This happened to me ten years ago when I was working as a forest ranger in Yosemite National Park. My name is Lyle Hathaway, and I never considered myself to be the superstitious type, dismissing any talk of strange creatures lurking in the shadows. I lived a simple life, married with two kids, coffee in the morning, and a cold beer after work. It was in the midst of a grueling week, tracking down illegal campfires and checking trail conditions. The sun hung low in the sky as I scanned my surroundings. The towering trees cast long shadows upon the ground while birds bickered above. I interrupted my patrol upon hearing something rustling behind me. Turning slowly, I noticed bushes quivering just out of sight. Expecting a harmless deer caught off guard, I trekked behind it. By the time I caught up to whatever it was, I found myself in a small clearing that smelled sickeningly sweet. Stifling the urge to gag, I saw crimson streaks on blades of grass and several patches of newly turned earth. Thinking it all too odd, I contacted my partner Huxley over the radio and gave him a brief rundown before waiting for his arrival. A cool wind picked up when Huxley stepped into the clearing ten minutes later. We exchanged stories about our days before getting down to business. Upon exploring further, we found broken branches hanging overhead and decided that somebody must have passed through recently. As we searched for clues about what or who we were dealing with, Huxley called me over to one spot where some crushed vegetation marked an obvious trail into thicker brushwork. This doesn't look good, Lyle, he said grimly. I gave him a nod of agreement, and that's when we heard it. A chilling scream pierced through the air from beyond sight line into denser foliage. Instinctively reaching for our utility belts where we kept our firearms, Huxley and I locked eyes wordlessly acknowledging the enormity of the situation before proceeding. We moved stealthily through the undergrowth, guided by the frenzied sounds which seemed to grow more urgent with each passing moment. After what felt like a lifetime, we came across a man tied between two trees. Shocked to see a naked body battered and bruised covered in strange symbols, we hesitated for a second. It wasn't until I heard Huxley's sharp intake of breath that I saw it, a beast beyond comprehension. Towering over seven feet tall and covered in patches of matted fur, it eyed us with contempt. Its twisted snarl revealed rows of jagged teeth that dripped with saliva. Its long, oversized arms with disproportionate limbs ended in razor-sharp talons. With its very presence shaking us to the core, Huxley and I fumbled for our guns. As we took aim at the creature, it lunged towards us faster than either of us could anticipate. In that unforgiving instant, the monster slashed Huxley across his torso with murderous intent. His agonized screams put me into panic mode while drops of blood splattered everywhere. 
My heart pounded as I scrambled to flee for help all while my former companion was rendered almost unrecognizable by this relentless beast from hell. My shaking hands tightened around the gun as I watched the creature tearing Huxley apart. His agonizing screams echoed in my ears, and sweat dripped down my back. I had to make a choice, stay and fight, or flee for help. I chose the latter. As I stumbled through the undergrowth, thoughts of guilt consumed me. What if I was the only hope Huxley had? Wasn't it my duty to defend him? My mind raced while I tried to find a logical reason not to call for help. But how could anyone have predicted such a monstrous creature was lurking in these woods? The sounds of cracking branches and snarls urged me not to give in, pushing me deeper into the forest. Streams of sunlight faded between the trees as I ventured into an unknown landscape. The growing darkness caused an unsettling tension to grip at me. Yet, alongside it was a strange and sudden realization that not calling for assistance might be my only chance at survival. Emerging from the foliage, I found myself at a clearing where several individuals were gathered around a campfire. Gasping for breath, I told them about Huxley's predicament and the horrifying creature that attacked us. While some expressed doubt, others sprung into action and reached for their weapons. An older man grabbed my arm as he handed me a machete. We must assume that it's not something we've encountered before, he warned with a grave expression on his face. Let's act quickly. Another camper chimed in gravely while loading his rifle. We might still have a chance at saving your friend. Setting off towards the gruesome scene we had left behind, our group moved cautiously yet swiftly through the dense vegetation in search of Huxley and the beast responsible for his injuries. We eventually returned to where once stood Huxley, but all that remained were streaks of blood staining torn clothing and gnarled bark. My stomach churned in despair, knowing we had arrived too late. Hearing growling in the distance, we trailed the noise until we found the creature feasting on another mangled body. Camper after camper attempted to fend off the beast, but each suffered the same terrible fate as Huxley. Exhausted and defeated, I desperately analyzed my surroundings for any means of escape. Nearby, a path led deeper into the woods where I assumed the horrendous creature originated from. I couldn't let this thing continue its rampage. I motioned to the dwindling group of survivors to follow me down the path. As we ventured further into this unknown territory, our weapons remained poised for action. There had to be a reason behind this creature's presence. Perhaps an answer awaited within these depths. We stumbled upon a cave tucked away among tangled roots and vines. Entering cautiously, our eyes struggled to adjust against such darkness. A pungent odor, similar to rotting meat, filled our nostrils while our ears rang with distant echoes of clicking claws. Inching forward, our flashlights revealed a gruesome sight. Piles upon piles of mutilated human remains covered every inch of the cave floor. Signs pointed to these victims being attacked and devoured by something with a voracious appetite. It had to be the very monster we were tracking. Stifling screams and powering through sheer terror, we ventured deeper until discovering an unsettling den of sorts for this horrifying creature, a space teeming with evidence of its destructive nature. Possessing proof of this new species' existence, and aware that we narrowly evaded becoming part of its next meal, we sought out logical steps forward in dealing with such a discovery. Authorities needed to be contacted about this deadly threat lurking on our doorsteps before it struck again. The lives of those lost had only heightened our resolve that no other person would suffer the same gruesome fate. As we reemerged from the darkness and into the world outside the cave, I couldn't shake those images forever etched in my memory. My life had been irreversibly molded by these events. 
It was now my purpose not only to remember Huxley and all the others that we lost, but to expose this unholy beast and ensure it never strikes again. I woke up to the sound of my alarm and quickly turned it off, already missing the comfort of sleep. I glanced around my bedroom while recalling a funny joke a friend had told me yesterday. It made me smirk and start my day in good spirits. My name is Frank Marsden, and I live in Spokane, Washington, working as a mechanic. I headed to work as usual, not expecting anything out of the ordinary. We had just received news about a murder that occurred nearby, so everyone was talking about it. My coworker Kira Simmons warned us not to walk alone at night until they caught the killer. Throughout the week, strange events unfolded in town. Two people went missing near our local park, an elderly woman named Theodora Manko and a college student named Addison Dupree. Tension grew in our community as law enforcement officers patrolled the area searching for the murderer. One evening after work, I met up with friends at a bar to unwind. As we shared jokes and drinks, I couldn't help but notice a tall man with scaly skin sitting a few tables away. That was odd around here, but I figured it wasn't important. Maybe he had some kind of skin disorder. Days later... I joined an evening jog hosted by fellow runner Amy Landis through our park's trail. Halfway through our run, we spotted something unusual nearby, what appeared to be deep claw marks on one of the trees. We brushed it off as animal damage and continued our route. Amy suddenly froze and pointed at something in the distance. Her finger trembled slightly. There it was again that tall figure with scaly skin lurking in the shadows. It seemed too menacing to approach or call out to we instinctively wanted to avoid drawing attention when we didn't even know if an actual threat was imminent yet. No one wanted to be alone after that, so we decided to continue our jogs in groups. More people went missing. Eldon Prigger, a local plumber, and Celine Bosch, a new mom in the neighborhood adding to the growing concern around our tight-knit community. On another group jog, we found ourselves nearing the reported murder site. As we hesitantly approached the area, we discovered something even more disturbing, traces of what seemed to be reptilian footprints and hastily erased signs of struggling. The realization that we might be dealing with someone or something much more dangerous and unnatural than we thought sent shivers down our spines. We shared our findings with Officer Roald Macbeth at the local police station, but he brushed them off as panic-induced imaginations. We knew that nothing would change unless we solved this mystery ourselves. I decided to venture through the park one evening after our group jog with my co-workers Davis Sinclair and Lita Hartley. We hoped to find evidence that would make authorities take us seriously. We arrived at the spot with reptilian tracks and carefully examined the surroundings. Something caught my eye, a faint trail of slime leading into the woods. We followed it until reaching a cave entrance hidden away from sight. We hesitated by the opening. At least one of us should alert town folks or call back up if needed. Davis volunteered to stay behind while Lita and I ventured inside, armed with flashlights and determined expressions. The cave was dark and damp, the echoing sounds of dripping water filling the unsettling silence. As we advanced through its narrow corridors lit by our weak flashlights, an overpowering stench of rotting flesh invaded our nostrils. Our hearts pounded against our chests as we finally entered a larger chamber filled with a gruesome sight, dismembered bodies floating in pools of blood mixed with slime and shredded clothing draped around like party decorations. Lita choked back bile as I fought to steady my breath when terror surged through our veins. We stumbled upon the monstrosity's lair, 
The brutal assailant terrorizing our town was a reptilian alien-like creature preying on innocent people. As we quickly turned to escape, Lita tripped over a protruding rock, letting out a loud yelp. Suddenly, a piercing screech sounded from the darkness behind us as the creature lunged into view, its grotesque jaw filled with dripping fangs clamped onto Lita's arm dragging her away with inhuman strength while she screamed in agony. In a split second, I realized that there was no time to think about calling for help or checking if Davis was still outside. Lita's life was at stake, and all I could do was try to save her. As the reptilian creature dragged her away, I lunged at it, aiming at its grotesque head with my flashlight. With a swift strike, the flashlight connected with its skull, causing the creature to let out an even more ear-piercing screech. Momentarily stunned, it dropped Lita, who was on the brink of losing consciousness from pain and fear. I quickly grabbed her good arm and pulled her up. We had to make our way toward the cave's entrance before the creature regained its senses. The overwhelming stench of death filled our nostrils as we struggled through the carnage-filled chamber. Every ounce of energy I had went into ignoring my terror and trying to not crumble under Lita's weight. As we neared the mouth of the cave, Davis came into view, his expression a mix of disbelief and horror upon seeing Lita's condition and hearing my hurried explanation of what happened inside. Without hesitation, Davis helped carry Lita while we stumbled back to our vehicle, on the drive back to town, there were no words exchanged between us. Our minds focused on getting help for Lita and alerting authorities about the monstrous reptilian creature now haunting our woods. Upon arriving in town, I rushed into a nearby convenience store to call 911. When emergency services arrived, they tended to Lita's injuries while listening to the account of our nightmare encounter with skepticism behind their professional demeanor. However, they couldn't deny that Lita had clearly been attacked by something incredibly violent and malevolent. The subsequent days were filled with local law enforcement officers and search teams combing the woods near the cave. It wasn't long before they discovered the gruesome scene in the chamber and recovered what was left of the victims. The entire town was shaken, and a veil of grief and fear settled like a thick fog. The authorities, however, failed to capture or kill the creature. Based on the findings in the cave, they speculated that it might be some rare, undiscovered predator that had found its way to our area. But they knew as well as I did that whatever it was, it was far from any known animal. As for Lita, she survived her ordeal but was deeply traumatized. Her arm required multiple surgeries to save it from infection and repair any semblance of functionality. The experience had a profound impact on her mental health too, leaving her consumed by nightmares and requiring therapy to process her fears. Despite everything we had gone through, there were those who refused to believe our story, thinking we were either crazy or delusional. As long as the reptilian creature remained at large, however, there were still others who lived in constant terror as they checked their windows and locked their doors every night. Unable to shake off my fears and concerns for Lita's safety, and all who lived in our town, I realized I couldn't stay here any longer. Eventually, I sold my house and moved thousands of miles away in an attempt to escape both my memories and the haunting presence of that nightmare creature. Whenever I read about unexplained missing persons cases or inexplicable animal attacks, a knot tightens in my stomach as I recall those dark hours spent within the confines of that cold, unforgiving cave. Even though most would doubt me if I shared my belief that an intelligent, brutal reptilian being haunted the woods near my old home I'd be better off not letting my imagination run wild. Instead, my thoughts linger on Lita and those whose lives were torn apart by something beyond our understanding. We'll always carry with us the marks left by our encounter with the darkness. 
whatever it was that we faced in that cave, will forever wonder about its nature, motives, and possible existence among us. Will we ever truly be free from the clutches of the nightmare it created? I'm Grant Thompson, and I work as a park ranger in Yellowstone National Park. My wife and I recently separated, so I find solace in the wilderness. Strolling through the dense forest, I enjoy the crunch of fallen leaves beneath my feet. An elk drinks calmly from a nearby stream. One day, while making my rounds, I hear a faint cry for help in the distance. It's muffled and strained, but I'm trained to help people in distress. Hurrying toward the sound, I find a disoriented tourist named Felicity Staver, claiming she woke up in a hidden cave near here after being kidnapped. Felicity believes a creature had dragged her away while she was walking alone. She's hesitant to share this information out of fear of sounding foolish. However, following her lead to an isolated cave concealed by dense foliage reveals unusual claw marks on trees and an overwhelming stench of decay lingering. As we approach the cave, Felicity notices a pair of hikers she knows, Jonah DeMarco and Sasha Levidos, both looking equally unnerved as they share their stories of mysterious disappearances nearby. The incident seems unbelievable to me due to its improbability. Still, their details and unsettling demeanor suggest there's something worth investigating further. My radio is dead. Even though this park has spotty reception at best, it's unusual that we have no signal at all. We can't call for help. Conversing among ourselves, we agree to cautiously explore this cave for more answers, especially due to recent strings of missing persons with no leads discovered yet. As we descend deeper into darkness, our flashlights uncover ripped clothing and random personal belongings peppered along damp walls. We come upon another cave dweller named Innes Cromwell captive inside. When released from his barely lit prison, he joins our uneasy collective venture through uncharted territory. Our surroundings become increasingly unsettling as we progress, eerie howls echoing in the distance claw marks on the cave walls intensifying in frequency. Our nervousness escalates without restraint. One by one, people make jokes to lighten the mood, but that nervous laughter barely covers the unnerving chills running down our spines. It's almost as if our misplaced humor accelerates an unseen force hulking near us. Venturing further into the complex network of tunnels, we stumble across gruesome scenes of inexplicable violence, blood stains splattering deep recesses with human body parts littering the cavern floor. As a park ranger, my training and wilderness experience help maintain composure in the face of horror, yet I'm struggling to suppress my natural instincts to run. Daily life never prepares you for this kind of monstrousness lurking outside normalcy's bounds. The more we discover these heinous atrocities unfolding before our eyes, the more evident something bloodthirsty lives here, preying upon innocent lives. As the foul stench intensifies around us, we barely notice a shifting shadow just beyond our flashlight beams. This menacing presence surrounds us slowly until facing it becomes impossible to avoid. There it stands a gigantic humanoid wolf creature bearing its sharp canines while staring menacingly into our souls. Its gruesome visage boasts powerful muscles rippling beneath mottled fur, accompanied by snarling elongated fangs dripping with drool and dark ooze. Looming above at least eight feet tall, it exudes a palpable presence of raw power and predatory intent. The beast lunges at us with breakneck speed, Felicity and Innes are grabbed right off their feet. I fire my gun directly at it hoping to stop its rampage as Jonah and Sasha also grimly take aim. Our bullets seem ineffective against such a formidable being. 
The monster snatches Jonah next, and transforming his fear into destructive fury, he throws his own life on the line to force an opening for Sasha and me to scamper away from this den of horrors. His scuffle with the creature becomes a deafening blend of growls, screams, gunfire, and tearing sinew that echoes through my mind for miles. Frantically escaping into the trees with Sasha, we attempt reaching higher ground in search of any hope for survival or rescue. Fear grips our breath as every step feels calculated. Behind us, agonized wails still reverberate as the snarling beast turns its attention toward me. Sasha and I, hearts pounding, race through the dense forest as the sounds of destruction and torment follow us. Branches whip at our faces while we navigate the treacherous terrain, driven by instinct and adrenaline. The need for survival overpowers any sense of loyalty to our friends left behind, and we do not look back. As we dart between trees, Sasha spots a small cabin nestled in a clearing ahead. We approach cautiously, not wanting to draw any more attention to ourselves. The door is unlocked, and we slip quietly inside. What was that thing? Sasha whispers, eyes filled with terror. I don't know, I reply. But we need help. Clutching my phone tightly, I try calling 911 but find that there's no signal here in the depths of the forest. Panic rises inside me. What can we do if assistance is unreachable? Searching for anything that could be useful in the cabin, Sasha discovers a landline phone in the corner. With trembling fingers, she dials the emergency number. We're being attacked, Sasha tells the operator hurriedly. There's this wolf creature thing, and it already took three of our friends. The operator tries to remain calm while obtaining our location but admits they have no information on what type of creature could be capable of such violence. They assure us help will be on its way soon. In an attempt at defense, Sasha and I barricade ourselves inside the cabin using whatever furniture we can find. With each moment that passes, fear engulfs us more and more. It becomes suffocating. We must trust that help is on its way, despite not understanding what or who can help us against this nightmarish villain. By some miracle, several hours pass with no signs of intrusion from the monster that hunts us. When local authorities arrive at the scene alongside heavily armed specialists who were briefed about our unknown attacker, we breathe a tentative sigh of relief. Sasha and I, exhausted from what seems like an eternity of fear, allow ourselves to be guided under their protection toward the nearest town. The rescue teams search for any sign of our friends, but Jonah, Felicity, and Innes all remain unaccounted for. During the brief interrogation that follows our rescue, we recount the grim details of the creature and its attacks. Though law enforcement struggles to find a reasonable explanation for these events, experts suggest the possibility we encountered some sort of genetically mutated canine or a highly aggressive wildlife species not yet documented. I lean on this assumption, even if my gut tells me otherwise. Werewolves don't exist in reality. I try to remind myself that there must be an objective and rational explanation for our experience. But despite my skepticism, visions of those powerful muscles hidden within mottled fur and those terror-inducing fangs still haunt my dreams at night. Time passes as life tries to mend itself after the horrifying ordeal. Authorities never recover felicity and in his bodies nor manage to capture the beasts responsible for their demise. We mourn them quietly among ourselves, forever haunted by those unforgettable screams. A year later, at a memorial service held in honor of our fallen friends, Sasha approaches me with hushed urgency in her voice. Have you heard? she asks quietly. There have been more attacks, just like what happened to us on the other side of the country. 
The unsettling revelation sends shivers down my spine and my mind races with unanswered questions. Was this mutation turning into an epidemic? Is it even possible that such creatures exist among us in reality? But I push these thoughts aside as irrational fantasies. Regardless of my fears or concerns about new attacks making headlines nationwide, one thing is clear. Out there in that forest where Felicity and Innes died alongside Jonah's sacrifice lies a cruel reminder, a terrifying reminder of an encounter with the unknown that will forever be burned into our memories. The service ends, and we each place a flower on the memorial for our friends. In that moment of silence and remembrance, I hold back tears. We don't know if what we faced was simply a freak of nature or something monstrous beyond anyone's current understanding, and maybe we never will. But I am determined to keep their memories alive, for they should not be forgotten, not by time or fear, not by the beasts that stole their lives. I'm Marcus Johnson, a mechanic with a passion for exploring abandoned places. I stumbled upon an old, dilapidated building on a road trip near Buffalo, New York. It was situated in the middle of nowhere but it piqued my interest. The exterior was crumbling, with vines entwined around its structure. Inside, dust filled the air, and decayed furniture lay scattered about. I decided to document my findings and share with fellow enthusiasts. I retrieved my camera and ventured deeper into the building. As I traversed the creaky hallways, I couldn't shake the sensation that I was being watched. Ignoring it, I pressed on, snapping photos of the forgotten structure. My heart skipped a beat when I discovered what appeared to be traces of blood smeared along the walls. Incredibly curious now, I searched for more clues within this eerie setting. A sense of unease encompassed me as my flashlight illuminated a hastily scrawled message on the wall. Stay away. Disregarding the warning, my curiosity urged me forward. I eventually came across a door leading to a basement. The steps were rotten and unstable, making my descent arduous and slow. At last I stood in the dank cellar. In one of its corners were piles of clothing most stained with blood accompanied by personal belongings. This is odd, I murmured, examining one of the faded family photos that littered the floor. Suddenly, an ancient record player crackled to life playing a long-forgotten tune in reverse, lyrics hauntingly distorted. The unsettling music stopped as abruptly as it had begun replaced by chilling laughter echoing through the darkness. As goosebumps formed on my skin, I heard heavy footsteps approach from behind, too slow for any human gait. My heartbeat accelerated as sluggish breathing filled my ears. Instinctively leaping out of reach just in time, I narrowly evaded capture. What I encountered couldn't possibly be human. It was a grotesque creature, part human, part wolf, towering over me. Its eyes were dark abysses emitting a cruel, predatory smirk. Realizing that 911 wasn't an option, as my actions had taken me far off the grid with no cellular signal, I considered my alternatives. My fight-or-flight response kicked into gear as the terrifying beast lunged at me again. Hey there, big guy! I blurted out sarcastically while dodging another swooping lunge. The creature's lack of speech and its monstrous visage confirmed it was no figment of my imagination. Defenseless, flight seemed my only course of action. Enraged by my close escapes, it intensified its attack razor-sharp claws inches from my face as I stumbled away. Dangerously cornered, I pulled out a flare gun from my backpack that I'd brought for nighttime excursions and fired without hesitation. The flare hit the creature directly in one of its ghastly black eyes, 
emitting an ear-piercing shriek. As it recoiled from the agonizing flare impact, I saw an opportunity to escape back up those rotten stairs. If I could just make it outside to catch some cell phone service. At least if someone found my body later on, they'd know about this abominable creature and wouldn't be caught off guard as well. Frantically climbing back up to the main floor, the hallway looked much more menacing than before. Debris converged into frightening silhouettes under the dim beams of my flashlight. With each step towards potential safety above, the chilling laughter grew louder, an indescribable terror urging me forward despite overwhelming fatigue from narrowly escaping death's grip countless times already. Looking back towards the cellar door, hoping it was locked, tendrils of seeping darkness provided no such relief. The only solace was the creature appeared to be momentarily incapacitated, and this delay could potentially save my life. I sprinted across the hall, desperately registered the now grotesque surroundings as I made my way to the exit. The powerful roars of the monstrous creature pursued me relentlessly, chainsaws grinding through thick darkness just steps behind me. Clumsily shattering those broken glass doors, I broke free from that hellish nightmare, with no time to glance back at the ghastly beast continuing its relentless pursuit. As my worn-out legs carried me through the darkness, I stumbled on jagged rocks and slipped in mud. Pain shot through my body, but I pushed on, determined to survive. The werewolf-like beast was still in pursuit, closing the gap between us with every step I took. A branch scraped against my face, cutting into my skin and drawing blood. I kept running despite feeling drained of energy. Soon enough, I found myself approaching the edge of a ravine. With a sharp drop below and no time to think of a better plan, I took a leap of faith into the abyss. I managed to grab onto a low-hanging branch, swinging myself onto an outcrop that jutted from the side of the ravine. The creature skidded to a stop at the edge before letting out another deafening roar of frustration as it lost sight of its prey. Exhausted, sore, and only vaguely aware of where I was, I glanced around frantically for an escape route. A thick tree trunk several yards away seemed like my best bet for getting to higher ground safely. Ignoring the pain in my legs, I leaped from rock to rock until finally reaching the tree. Clambering up its rough bark and winding through its limbs proved challenging, but adrenaline kept me going as fear remained close behind. Once safely atop a sturdy branch high among leaves and shadows, I allowed myself a moment to assess my situation. My phone had fallen somewhere during my chaotic escape, no help would be coming from outside sources any time soon. Surveying my surroundings from this precarious perch, I caught sight of a road winding its way towards civilization about half a mile away. An idea formed in my head. If only I can get down there, maybe passing cars would protect me from this monstrous abomination. Riding on slivers of hope and desperation alone, I swung myself between the treetops like a delirious Tarzan, propelling myself closer to salvation one sprained ankle at a time. Hitting the ground running, I sprinted towards the road, the beast's raucous growls still visible in the distance. Just as I made my way out of the woods and onto the pavement, a truck turned the corner at full speed. Flagging it down seemed like something straight from a fantastical nightmare, but I had no choice. The driver slammed on his brakes to avoid hitting me. Throwing open the passenger door, I yelled at him to drive and quickly clambered into the truck. As we sped away from the nightmare in those woods, the driver berated me for my recklessness but eventually took pity upon seeing my multiple wounds and haggard appearance. Reassured of my safety in his company, I stared out of the window as we drove away from what could have been my demise. On our way back to town, I recounted my nightmarish experience, 
detailing every bit of this werewolf-like creature that had almost succeeded in tearing me apart. Though he listened intently, his doubtful expressions angered me since all evidence had been left behind in that cur cellar. The driver took me to a nearby emergency room where I received treatment for my injuries before filing a police report. They listened attentively but ultimately attributed my story to hysteria born from stress and fatigue after all. This supposed werewolf left no proof other than my obvious trauma. Eventually, life resumed its regular pace. The nightmares plagued me for weeks on end, though the monster never showed itself again. However, upon returning to that old house months later with a few friends to prove its existence, we found nothing but rubble where it once stood. Though no concrete answers surfaced in connection to that evening's horrors, people began sharing stories of similar encounters they or others experienced around town. The legend of this unknown beast quickly replaced the disbelief and skepticism associated with my wild tale. Now, many months later, I still find myself looking over my shoulder. While life has returned to a semblance of normalcy, it is almost impossible to quell the lingering fear that this creature or another of its kind still roams, waiting for its next helpless prey to unsuspectingly stumble into darkness and terror. But one thing's for sure the knowledge and caution born of my harrowing brush with potential death make me ever vigilant fully aware that one step into the shadows could prove to be disastrous. As a search and rescue officer for the United States Forest Service, I've stumbled across some odd things, but nothing could have prepared me for this. Incident. The term, incident, sounds a bit too mild for what transpired, but, like any good story, I'll start from the beginning. My buddy, Jedediah Sullivan, and I had been walking along the Appalachian Trail's least traffic section in Pennsylvania. Our task was simple make sure hikers were following the proper rules and regulations. This area was breathtakingly beautiful with lush greenery surrounding us on both sides of the trail and clean mountain air filling our lungs. While we enjoyed our trek through nature, the distant sound of laughter caught our attention. Following it to a nearby offshoot trail, we saw a group of youngsters sitting around a campfire trading jokes. What do you call a creature with no sense of humor? One young man asked. Grumpy, another responded, all roaring with laughter. Sharing some friendly banter and reminding them about trail safety guidelines, we continued our trek further into the wilderness. As daylight began to fade, Jedediah spotted something strange ahead on the trail. The sight stopped us in our tracks an enormous gnarled footprint that resembled a combination of a bear and a large bird. We looked at each other quizzically before deciding to follow these mysterious tracks. The deeper we went into the woods following those tracks, the more foreboding everything became. Broken branches lined our path as if something massive had charged through the area with reckless abandon. Soon we found ourselves at the entrance of what looked like an abandoned mine shaft tucked away in an uncharted part of this forest that neither of us had ever encountered during our years as search and rescue officers. A faint smell of both decay and sulfur wafted from deep within as we cautiously entered the dark mine shaft with weapons drawn. It was evident we had stumbled across the lair of something fearsome and our once jovial demeanors shifted into steely determination as we ventured further into the darkness. Not long after, we heard the unmistakable sounds of distress up ahead. The anguished screams echoed throughout the mine, compelling us to pick up the pace despite our trepidation. As we rounded a corner, we came face to face with what might only be described as an abomination. Hunched over in front of us was a creature straight out of our worst nightmares. It resembled some sort of twisted melding of a wolf and a gigantic reptile, 
covered in coarse fur and scales that seemed fused together in ways that would make Dr. Frankenstein's experimentations pale in comparison. Its eyes were deep-set and black as coal yet burned with rage and hunger that sent chills down our spines. Its massive claws dug into the rock beneath it while its serpent-like tail twitched excitedly. There on the cold, clammy floor lay two trembling hikers bound by thick vines. They stared at us with what little hope remained in their terror-stricken eyes. Jedediah whispered fiercely to me that he was going to flank the creature from behind as I covered him from my position with my rifle aimed carefully at the beast. Swiftly moving in coordinated and calculated precision, Jedediah snuck around to one side while I shot a short burst to distract the creature momentarily. The creature tilted its head menacingly and let out a guttural hissing growl that rattled me down to my core. In an instant, Jedediah launched into action, swiping his machete at the creature's tail with all his might. The creature let out a pained howl and focused its attention on him, giving me a small window of opportunity to rescue the bound hikers. I quickly seized the opportunity, sprinting towards them as Jedediah continued to fend off the beast. While cutting the vines that held them captive, I instructed the hikers in hushed tones to crawl back toward the entrance of the mine shaft as inconspicuously as they could. They nodded frantically, their fear driving them into action. As I watched them begin their escape, Jedediah and the creature continued their battle. Every time Jedediah struck a blow with his machete, the creature swiped back with its deadly claws. It was a dance of death. One wrong move could spell disaster for either party. Jedediah yelled at me to get my attention. I can't keep this up forever. We need help. There was no denying it. We were outmatched and outclassed by this monstrous creature. I took out my phone and immediately dialed emergency services while aiming my rifle at the creature, waiting for any chances to fire without hitting Jedediah in the process. The operator quickly answered, and I described our situation as thoroughly as I could while trying to remain focused on the fight before me. The operator assured me that help was on its way and that we needed to hold on until they arrived. Hanging up the phone, I tried to figure out how we were going to survive long enough for help to reach us. With each passing second, Jedediah's moves began to slow down from exhaustion and fear. The creature used this opportunity to strike harder and faster, leaving Jedediah grazed by its claw swipe. He winced in pain but kept pushing onwards. He was a true epitome of strength and courage. Taking any chances I could, I fired shot after shot at the creature. Though it didn't seem to be slowing down, I believed my shots were still inflicting some damage, disorienting the creature and buying us more time. In that tense and endless time of waiting, we continued our struggle, both me shooting and Jedediah fighting off the beast in close combat. The mineshaft echoed with the sounds of our confrontation, a chilling contrast to the earlier screams that had brought us here. Finally, after what felt like hours but must have been only minutes, we heard approaching footsteps. Help had arrived. Several armed officers stormed into the mine shaft and opened fire on the creature, their barrage of bullets finally seeming to weaken it. Cornered and outnumbered, the creature let out one last desperate snarl before retreating further into the mine shaft. It vanished into the darkness, leaving behind only its terrible stench and claw marks as proof of its existence. The officers helped Jedediah back to his feet as we took stock of the situation. The hikers from earlier were attentive to them when we emerged from the mine shaft. It seemed they had made it out safely. Their expressions showed a mixture of relief and gratitude as they gripped onto family members for support. We later found out that those family members had called for help when they heard their screams from outside. Authorities quickly closed off and secured the area along with launching an investigation. They scoured every inch of that mine in search of the creature but came up empty-handed. It had simply vanished without a trace. The injured hikers recovered, 
scarred forever by their horrific experience but grateful to be alive. Jedediah nursed lasting physical injuries and deep psychological shadows from his fight with that twisted creature. Looking back at our harrowing ordeal, one thing's for sure. There are things in this world that defy explanation, things that emerge from the depths of darkness. But one thing was certain, as long as humans are around, we will always fight back and stand firm against any challenge, however terrifying and monstrous it may be. It's been a while since that day, and life continues its inexorable march onward. But to this day, either Jedediah nor I dare venture near that mine shaft. Some things should just be left undisturbed, safely in the shadows of the unknown.